Welcome, everyone. Um, I will call the meeting to order. The agenda indicated that we did have an, that we had an executive session at 5:30. We actually did cancel that executive session, so we are now being called to order. Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. Wintrow here. Asklund here. Sims here. Hausch here. McQueen here. Also present are Village Manager Patty Bates, Assistant Village Manager John Young, Supervisor of Streets and Parks Jason Hamby and uh, the village solicitor, Chris Connard. And just to explain um, this evening, we've, we decided uh, at our retreat and we kind of confirmed at um, the last couple of meetings that we are going to a work session. Tonight at seven o'clock we go into our work session, which is a, a more informal way of engaging and discussing topics. We encourage you all to stay, it's going to be about sidewalks and then we'll also at the end have our information on the um, on the commissions reports from the commissions but because of the fact that we did have legislation with multiple readings that we needed to continue we're having this special meeting at six o'clock tonight where we will hear the legislation um, multiple pieces of legislation um, the petitions and communications we actually have two lists of petitions and communications the ones that are listed at the top part of the agenda refer specifically to the legislation that we're going to be hearing this evening Lori did you want to review those uh, yes um, <clears throat> there was a letter from Linda Radowski that I read last week um, I uh, earlier today mischaracterized it as supporting the policy but it, um, she just reiterated that she sees uh, it as legitimate to, uh, to have the uh, utilities ultimately be the responsibility of the property owner. Marie Slattery, who's the landlord, opposes the policy, expressed concerns about a particular property. There was a back and forth with Melissa Van Sant. Um, uh, Carol Hicks, uh, retiree and landlord, opposes the policy change. And Paul Abendroth wrote, um, saying he believes the language is problematic um, in particular because relationships are not clearly defined enough and the dis utility dispute resolution board is given too much power and it also included the draft minutes from our last meeting again since this is we decided that we wanted to keep this special meeting only for the legislation that's on the agenda we will actually review and approve the minutes at our June meeting um, so but we, we decided to have them in for reference in case people needed to refresh their memories of what was said at the meeting so um, we'll move into public hearings and legislation the first being the second reading and public hearing of ordinance 2015-07 and we can do that by title only all right this is an ordinance rezoning 104 North Dina Avenue located in the village of Yellow Springs Ohio 45387 for C conservation with gateway overlay district to B1 central business with gateway overlay uh, can I have a motion please so move second, second. Uh, John would you please um, do a brief review uh, a packet isn't loading on my iPad but I will give you everything I can remember off the top of my head uh, so this is an application that was um, went before the Planning Commission in their uh, April meeting and uh, the Planning Commission recommended approval of the MAP amendment. The MAP amendment basically uh, rezones the property at 104 Xenia, which is the home of Peaches Restaurant, from conservation where it was erroneously zoned conservation uh, during the zoning MAP update in 2013 and is now going to be going back to Business 1, which is part of the Central Business District Zoning District and the gateway overlay is being maintained from each zoning district. Thank you. Any comments, questions from council? Uh, this is a second reading and public hearing, so I would open the floor to citizen comments. <coughs> questions? Seeing and hearing none, I'll bring it back to council table. Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Hausch? Yes. Askland? Yes. Sims? Yes. Winter? Yes. Okay. Uh, next is second reading and public hearing of ordinance 2015-09. Judy, you could, I think we can read that one by title only also. All right, this is amending section 1042.01 of the codified ordinances with respect to determination of the power supply cost adjustment. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Uh, Patty, would you explain this one? 
Sure. This is one of the recommendations that John Courtney made um, when he was here early earlier um, in May to discuss the uh, utility rates or the electric rates. And it has to do with the way we calculate our power supply cost adjustment. Um, currently, we do it on a 12-month average, so it rotates forward every month. Um, that is causing us uh, to show a, a bit of a loss every time we calculate that. And he proposed that we calculate it every three months so that it um, keeps it on a more even scale with what is actually being um, what it's actually costing us and applying it across more evenly to the residents. Okay. Comments, questions from council? <coughs> this is second reading and a public hearing. Um, are there any uh, comments or questions from citizens? See, can you come up to the oh, sure. microphone? I just was going to say that does the billing change on that then? No, uh -uh. no, no, no. The power no. supply cost adjustment is on every bill. is just different on every bill because it's recalculated every every month. It's yeah, it's kind of invisible. It's yeah. not something that ever really becomes yeah. visible to the public. It's uh, the fluctuation of our rates. Okay, I'll bring it back to council table. Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes, Asklund. Yes, Housh. Yes, McQueen. Yes, Sims. Yes, <coughs> yes. Uh, next on the agenda is the first <coughs> reading of Ordinance 2015-10, second quarter supplemental appropriations. Um, I, I, I'm just thinking we'll, we'll have, will you be able to review this? I, I, I'm not sure we need to read the whole thing. I think we can, and we will have a second reading? You can have a second reading. No. It does not need to be, I just checked with Melissa. Okay. So it does not need to be passed as an emergency. Okay. So let's just read it by title only and... Um, Patty can review the numbers and then we'll read it completely at the second reading. Okay, so this is the 2015 <clears throat> su Supplemental Appropriations and Declaring an Emergency um, for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio. Oh, it does say declaring. We should probably strike that. Or, or well, are we going <clears> to <throat> declare it an emergency yeah. so it takes effect immediately? Yes, and then okay. give it two readings. So we'll have two readings. Okay, very good. Can I have a motion, please? So move. Second. Okay. Patty? Um, these are just the, the general supplemental appropriations. It's a regular course of business where um, something comes up that wasn't appropriated. For instance, the uh, boiler that went down in this building that we need to replace or something like that um, that was not appropriated during the regular budget process last fall, but has come up in the meantime. And um, you can see the supplemental appropriations for the general fund are in total $11,800. Uh, for the special revenue funds, they're $2,800. Um, the total capital project changes are $5,000. The enterprise fund um, supplemental appropriations are $90,000. So the grand total of all supplemental appropriations in this ordinance is $109,600. And what this does is um, just allows those purchases to be uh, made legitimately out of those funds. This is a step that's required by the auditor to uh, appropriate those funds. Um, they are available, they just were not technically appropriated for those uses during the budget process. Can you, can you review the notes just so that if, if anybody has any questions, sure. maybe they can bring those to the next meeting? Sure. Uh, the supplemental appropriations out of the cable fund, um, $5,000, 3500 that was for the Miller Fellow um, because um, we did keep CABA to do kind of double duty. Um, right, but we get reimbursed for we that. We do get reimbursed. And then $1,500 for the station manager position. Uh, planning, there was a supplemental appropriation of $3,500 um, over the amount that was encumbered in 2014. For the Green County Regional Planning, um, that is the final amount that we needed to pay them on our previous contract with them that we had before John came on board. Um, HRC, $3,300. Again, I believe that is for Miller Fellow. Yeah, what happened was uh, that was appropriated out of the HRC's $8,500. Um, but actually, again, that's reimbursed by the Community Foundation. So mm -hmm. Melissa was just adjusting that so that it was the 8,500 that we approved. 
Um, then you see street maintenance and repair, $20,500 in that. It says to cover the uh, purchases for the ARCAM project, but that is the amount that is equal to the amount that was donated for the project. So that is not actually costing the village anything. It just needs to be assigned to that project. Uh, Bryan Center, 11500 for the new boiler. Uh, forfeited uh, federal forfeited assets um, it is actually decreasing that fund because um, Melissa discovered that the federal monies and the state monies uh, could not be commingled so she split them into two separate funds um, and 42,700 of that needed to be taken out of the federal forfeited assets and moved into the state fund which is called the state law enforcement trust fund um, and um, it also split the federal forfeited assets into two funds, 215 and 216. Um, and then you'll see in the next line the state law enforcement trust fund of 2,500 or 25,000. That's 25,000 out of the forfeited assets that goes into the state, and then the rest of it was split into those two funds. Uh, Parks and Recreation Improvement Fund, $5,000 to cover the skate park infection uh, inspections. And the electric fund, $90,000 for the new remote meters. 50000 of that is village funds, and 40000 of that is grant funds. Okay. Questions, comments from council? Questions, comments from citizens? Seeing and hearing none, we'll bring it back to the table for a vote. Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. <coughs> Sims? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Housh? Yes. Askland? Yes. Wintrow? Yes. <coughs> Uh, next on the agenda is Resolution 2015-18. Um, um, I was just seeing if there was something that I wanted to have read. It's not, it's basically, it. go ahead and read by title only. Yep. Doesn't give you great <laughs> acclaim or anything. It's pretty basic. <laughs> this is the contact with the Clerk of Council. So um, we were, oh, can I get a motion please? So I move. Second. Um, we were a little delinquent this year, especially, I guess, we were actually 15 months delinquent <laughs> in uh, <laughs> reviewing Judy and getting a new contract to her. So um, we were working on that. We had a couple of uh, executive sessions, I think maybe just one executive session, excuse me, to review that. So um, we, uh, her, her performance review was exemplary by all council members. Um, we talked to staff. Staff feels very strongly and positively about Judy, so we're very happy to um, renew her contract and um, give her a, um, a slight merit pay increase. Um, so um, we're happy with that. Any other comments or questions from council? Good job. Yeah, thanks for all the hard work. You're very welcome. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Okay, finally, we've got the third reading and public hearing of Ordinance 2015-06. And um, again, let's just do this by title only and then we'll be able to, to work our way through the description and explanation. Okay, this is rescinding old sections 1040.02 through 1040.04, 1040.08, and 1040.99 of the Yellow Springs Code of Ordinances and adopting new sections 1040.02 through 1040.04, 1040.08, and 1040.99 of the Yellow Springs Code of Ordinances. Thank you. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, Patty, um, would you please do a review of... Um, where we are and anything that has developed since the last reading? Um, there haven't really been any uh, additional changes. Um, we did change the procedure um, as we discussed the last time. Um, this will not uh, apply to when leases are renewed. It would only apply to um, new leases when you put a new tenant in. Um, and uh, also I do want to stress that um, while the ordinance language um, will be what it is if, if council chooses to pass this, the procedure itself and the implementation is, you know, it, it can be changed. We can work with that if we find that something isn't working out well or it's not going the way that um, we thought it was or, 
you know, a problem arises, the procedure itself is, it, it can be changed, it can be adapted, it's, it's a living, breathing <coughs> document. And so, you know, that is something that everyone needs to be aware of. I also want to reiterate that um, uh, I just lost my turn. <laughs> also, um, I want everyone to know there was a question that came up at the last meeting about um, how to interpret your bill and how to get them explained. And Melissa did come out with a handout, which is in your packet. That leads you step by step through your bill and how to understand it. And she is also holding a, um, a public session for anybody that wants to come where she will explain to you how to calculate your bill and how to understand it and what goes into determining it. Um, so and that's that is May there. 20th at 2.30? Uh, I believe that is the date, yes. Patty, yes, will that be videotaped? Um, I don't believe we planned on it, but uh, I, I maybe like she to, did. She mentioned something about putting it on. I'd like to request five. that it be videotaped okay. and put on our ch local channel because that's an inconvenient time for anyone yeah. who's working. Yeah. So, okay. Um, well, Susan and I will get our heads together and see about getting that done. And um, and where's the meeting? I believe she's doing an A and B. <coughs> and there is a flyer in your packet about it. Um, yeah. Right yes. There. Um, so anyone that wants to come, she will have examples and be able to show you how to calculate your bill. Um, and it, it, it is fairly complicated unless you have something in front of you that you can go through step by step. So um, because you have to use two previous month's bills and it just gets a little complicated. So anyone is welcome to attend. Um, I think there was one other change that, that uh, rather than um, the standard language of going into um, effect within Correct. 30 days after this final reading, we it will not go into effect until January 1st of 2016. That is correct. Um, before we um, go to citizen comments, do, does council have any questions or comments? Okay. Um, this is the third and final reading and public hearing. And um, I ask that you come up to the podium and speak into the microphone. We have three minutes. Judy will be keeping time for comments. Um, and something I actually didn't say at the beginning, to turn your cell phones off. I think oh, I turned mine off. I didn't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh. Can we ask questions before we make the comment? Um, you, we're, we're gonna. This is going to be open. You'll have time to ask questions. If you want to make comments later, then you can go. This we have 40 minutes or so for this, so I think we'll be able to have a, a hear from everyone. So I saw Judith's hand up first, and if I didn't already say it, to state your name. Yes, I'm, I'm Judith Hempfling. Hello there. I'm going to be very quick because I only have three minutes. I have a few things I wanted to say. I, uh, I'm against this uh, proposed utility policy. I strongly uh, support Lori's rec recommendations for amendments to the policy. Um, several points. First, the village utility collection practices were in need of major uh, cleanup. It's been done by the staff. I understand it's, it's been great. That's excellent. I think if we, you add collections to the continued shutoff policy, uh, that the loss will go down over time when people realize the village uh, is following through. Number two, the auditor's comments. Uh, the auditor is about the bottom line. She's not uh, an economic development person. She's not a housing person. You've made changes that were needed, and you, the council, need to think holistically about the issue. Number three, J Ellis Jacobs has noted that standard practice across the country to deal with these losses is a slight increase in the utility bill, as Lori's recommending and that it's a painless solution, uh, why not do it? Number, uh, in terms of the comments that the communities that have done this, there's no negative effects, I would guess, I'm wondering what kind of data collection was actually done, if there actually was any data collection done, because if not, nobody can know that that is actually true. Um, next, why support a policy which goes around uh, consumer protections that, um, that regulate the amount of utility put deposits collected and that disallow the use of credit reports by making the landlords responsible. Number five, why consider a policy which makes it more difficult for landlords to continue practices which help low-income people? 
for example, a landlord who chooses not to do a credit report. We know that credit reports are particularly disabling uh, for people, people of low income and people of color um, often have lower credit ratings and it often gets in the way of a lot of things in terms of their abilities to be full members of our economy. Um, next, um, in terms of economic development, I discussed this policy with my brother-in-law who helped bring 200 new jobs to my hometown of Dallas, Ohio in the last two years. He owns the building in which this business expansion is taking place. The electric bill for that uh, activity is $25,000 a month. When I told him about this policy, he said it would be a huge disincentive for the kind of economic development of uh, this particular instance, that the increase in square footage costs, which the increased risk would cause, would make it very difficult for um, businesses to compete with the uh, adjoining communities. And finally, I'm concerned about a dynamic in this debate in which council appears to feel obliged to accept an unamended staff recommendation in a way which has made it difficult to have an open discussion with the citizens they represent regarding the best policy for our community. I got it all done. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Sam? Can I, oh, since, since uh, Judith uh, referenced um, me a couple of times, I want to just make clear to anybody who may not have received, I send an email out every week to um, to people who have asked to be on my email list uh, about what I'm thinking about the uh, the policy, the things that are coming before council. And I indicated in my email this afternoon that I'm planning to return to my earlier no vote. Mm -hmm. And the the reasons I gave were about affordable how affordable affordability and um, concerns about economic development as um, as Judith referenced. and um, the alternative I propose is that owner occupied policies, uh, owner occupied properties would be guaranteed through property tax, and owners of all rental units must prove they are not owner occupied or they would be included in that. And uh, renters need to have a lease in hand, and landlords should provide leases in a timely fashion, certify that no one on the pro with a property interest in the home is living in the home, and I think it would be a good time at that point to indicate that there is a deposit due, and then from renters, then the standard um, deposit would be collected. I did say this afternoon that it would need to be bigger. Um, I don't know that it can be too much bigger. I've, I've gotten more feedback on that. Um, I think probably a certain amount of loss is just needs to be spread across the board um, to support those interests. So that's what I said to make a, give a little more context to what Judith was saying. Thanks, Lori. Um, Sam. Hi, I'm Sam Young. Uh, I've been a little discouraged lately about the prospects for passage of this law, um, primarily because I believe it to be anti-business in nature. Um, in earlier weeks, we, some of us landlords, uh, tried to meet with village officials to discuss the impact of this law on business prospects. Um, Pat Ertl's letter of March 26 to the Yellow Springs News was going to be the basis for this discussion, but the village declined to meet with us about it um, and stated in the process that that subject was immaterial to uh, future economic development efforts. Um, I think this was most unfortunate. I see it as quite different. I think we can all agree that the passage of this law would be a disincentive to investment in commercial real estate. Uh, we can argue about whether this disincentive is large or small, um, but I think we can still recognize the fact of it. Um, since this is the way many business developments are financed and the way many growing businesses finance their growth, I think it's quite pertinent to the village's future. Throughout recent five or six decades, Yellow Springs has enjoyed the presence of several organizations who were large consumers of electricity, water, and or sewer. These businesses helped sustain the utility enterprise funds with their level of consumption. Two of these businesses have closed. One has moved a substantial division out of Yellow Springs, and one is struggling to regain its former stature. 
Only one is sustaining the utility consumption of past years. We should consider this carefully before we set new rates, doubling or tripling or whatever our uh, water and sewer rates to pay for a new sewer plant or new uh, treatment plant. In passing this utility law, the village is going to gain about $15,000 a year from landlords. I think it's providing a significant disincentive to business development, which would provide a lot more, maybe fifty or $100,000 a year in utility consumption, um, income taxes, and school district taxes. I think that this is penny wise and pound foolish, and I encourage council to not pass this law. Laurie's proposal, on the other hand, maximizes, maybe not 100%, but maximizes utility collections without creating the disincentive for future business development. I would encourage council to reject the first one and get behind Laurie's proposal. Thank you, Sam. Anyone else? Sandy. Oops. <laughs> Sorry, technical difficulty. Three minutes is <laughs> I'm Sandy Love, and I was going to say today before I read Lori's me memo that I hope you will in future listen to the citizens you are representing and not the staff, not the state auditor, and not every other village in the area. I think it's not appropriate to fo form our policies with those people. You guys have to figure out the policy and what's best for us. And you need to think in that way, not in slavishly following the direction of somebody else. But I know you're all capable of doing that. And I, after f seeing Larry's proposal, I think it solves all those problems. Uh, it would help us keep our diversity, our unique, friendly, humanist, democratic culture in Yellow Springs. And we would also like to keep and attract business to keep, help pay for our utility services without excessive rate increases. And therefore, we would prefer not to adopt anti-business policies. Thank you. Thanks. Other comments? Bob? <coughs> Two quick questions, Bob Baldwin. Uh, number one, if the bill is sent out on the 1st, it's due on the 15th. If it's not paid by the 30th, is it cut off? Do they get 30 days or 15 days? The, the bill was, would not be cut off until the, after the 15th of the next month. 30 days. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, okay, you've answered the first question. Second question. Is it cut off if they offer a partial payment, it, or it is cut off? It would it it, it would depend on if the name the, the um, utilities were in the property owner's name or the tenant's name. Um, in in under the new policy, if it's kept in the tenant's name and the tenant requested a payment plan then we would allow that under certain circumstances, which have been tightened up quite a bit. If it's kept in the landlord's name and the landlord does not want the tenant to have a, a payment yeah. plan, then they would not. Yeah. That's a dangerous precedent. I've been around here long enough to know that anytime you're given some wiggle room, everybody's going to wiggle. Well, if and, they, when, and when they know it's due or the electricity gets shut off, the bill gets paid. Okay, you've answered my two questions. I'm here not as a, a landlord, particularly, but as a lifetime resident of Yellow Springs. I'm born here in 33. I want this village to succeed. Uh, I know you're in a budget crunch, and I give you high marks for searching out every place you can find some economies. However, on this landlord issue, I think it's somewhat overblown. I, I don't have I mean, I just don't have time to sift out everything it said, but I do remember that at one time, four accounts took care of $7,000 worth of delinquencies. And I do know that the billing procedure up to this point where I could, it could be 
almost 50 days before something happened if I was late. So I know there are, you have to search out economies. The Antioch Publishing blip is gone. I won't say you're broke, but I'm saying you have to, you have to be very frugal. And I am a frugal pragmatist. But I truly believe if I miss the 15th, and I just sent you folks 2,500 bucks, if I miss it, you're gonna affect, you're gonna charge me 5%. I really, just from the top of my head, feel you're gonna gain much more money from this 5% penalty, which any bank charges after the 15th on any mortgage, that it, it will far and exceed what the loss is. The last thing I wanna say is, I don't think anything good can happen from this bill. I think you're, you're overblown. It will definitely affect the diversity we embrace. And uh, I would like to see council put it on hold for at least 90 days to see if tightened up procedures out of the utility department with a new realization that, that uh, tightening can be done, that you sit on this for 90 days and we see what happened and as a, as a community member, if you can at 90 days say, Baldwin, it's not working, we still have these losses, we've <coughs> got to cut them down, then I, I won't say I would embrace what you want to do 100%, but I would certainly be much more agreeable to what you're trying to do. But I think you're do, trying to do it too fast. I think it's a, a gross overreaction and the law of unintended consequences is on the horizon in a lot of areas. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. Anyone else? Betty? Oops, be careful. Betty Ford, and I can be Bob. I've been here 88 years today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I guess you realize this is on the news. Have you heard it on the news? That Yellow Springs is voting tonight as to whether or not landlords will pay utilities it was on the 12 o'clock news cbs which i think is very I'm, it's a fact i'm not lying which is very bad for people that are thinking of leaving they'll say oh the landlord's going to pay it i don't have to worry about it but that's not what i really got up to say it was on the news but why don't we consider having the the tenant has a $200 deposit, am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. They get all utilities. If they, number one, I don't think the village should let the, the utility bill get past $200. And I think when it gets to that point, you could say to the tenant, your, your deposit is going to pay your bill. You have 30 days to come and reimburse that deposit or your utilities will be cut off. At that time, you could also advise the landlord. The landlord's gonna get on the tenants. I'm not gonna let my tenants live without utilities because the property would not be decent, safe, and sanitary. I'm not gonna allow it. So it's just as a proposal. Think about it and remember what you're doing. Channel 7 knows. Thank you, Betty. Anyone else? Oh, Joe, Paul's, okay, he's, he's. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no go, right. ahead, Joe. Go, go ahead, Joe. Joe, go ahead, Joe. Go, Joe. It's just gonna be short. I, you know, I, I think everybody here wants to do what's best for everybody. And, and, and if we can try to resolve it, I think it's gonna work for everybody. And a lot of good things have come out with Judith and Lori and everyone here, Sam. It's just something to think about. And I think once we do, we'll be able to resolve everything. We're Yellow Springs. We always hang together. You know that. Thanks, Joe. Paul? <clears throat> hey, Paul Avendroth. As I understand it, the motivation for this legislation is, uh, has two factors, at least. One is the auditor's finding that uh, the, the current procedures and, and policy are, are not significant, uh, sufficient. And, that's fine, uh, redo it. The other is a policy to drive collection losses to zero, to go after every penny owed to the, to the uh, village government. I don't 
uh, subscribe to that. I think it's it's often chasing bad, uh, bad money with good. It's wasteful to do that. Uh, there are some recommendations I would make to wording in the policy, but the current words you're looking at don't have a space for those uh, recommendations. Uh, when you, if you revise this and have an area for collections and penalties and deposits again, then I would have some comments on that. I think this policy needs more work and should not be voted. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Anyone else? Okay, seeing and hearing none, I'll bring it back to council table. I have, I have a couple of things um, that I wanted to. Okay, uh, Patty has a couple of uh, clarifications or comments to the comments that were made. Um, one of the things where my, what I was going to mention when I completely lost my train of thought. Um, the changes, the other changes to the policy, the things that we've tightened up, those again have already been in place. I mean, we've already been doing them. Did Melissa just put them in writing? Yes, but we've already been doing them. They've already been in place and we've probably already recognized what we're going to recognize from tightening those things up. And um, the 5%, Mr. Baldwin, that, that also is in place. That's been in place by the ordinance for some time. So I just wanted to make sure that you understood that. There's quite a rainfall. <laughs> Sometimes, yes. Okay, let's um, I, just. I had one question. Okay. Um, Sam or, or Jude, uh, Sandy said that the landlords had asked to meet with the village and the village refused. Our I met with everyone who asked to meet. Sam, who did you ask to meet with? Um, there was an effort by myself and Sheila, I think Dundee is your name, um, and Pat Earle. And it came early in April and we talked to John Young. So, so you did meet with the village? No. no, we did not. We called and asked for a meeting and we were told no. And you talked to John? Sheila did, I did not personally. I didn't get a request for a meeting from anybody. So I apologize if that was a miscommunication, but uh, I did talk, I do recall talking to Sheila at some point, but she did not ask me to have a meeting with her, so. I had it set up with Pat Earl to join that meeting because of his letter in the news, and I had to call him back and say, you're off the hook, the meeting's not going to happen. Well, I'm un unaware of the meeting being scheduled, so. Um, okay, well, I'll go ahead. Let's just go down the line. Yeah, okay. Um, of course, this has been a discussion that's been going on for, I guess, five months, I guess. Um, and while I agree that this isn't, uh, I would like to have seen a better uh, forum for discussion, uh, that doesn't mean that we council members haven't been listening. Um, I certainly have been listening. I think all the council members have been listening and sometimes if we disagree, it doesn't mean we're not listening. Um, I, I, a lot of the discussion is about who should bear the risk. And I, I think a good case has been made that our utilities should not bear the risk of rental, and we're mostly talking about rental units, mostly both uh, residential and commercial. Um, at the same point, I think there are other things that can be done. Um, one of the HRC members is starting to develop, I think what she's called, uh, Yellow Springs em Emergency Network. Village Assistance Network. Uh, yeah, Village Assistance Network to, de uh, to get funds so that low-income tenants who are having trouble with utilities could have some resource local resource. Um, in terms of commercial, um, I, get, I would like to see if there's some way that the sustainability, economic sustainability group could have some kind of fund that if there is some kind of business that we're clear, we, the village, is clear that it's a new business that makes sense to have here, if there's some kind of way that the village can Agree, have some fund to absorb some kind of risk, I'd certainly be interested in us looking at that, but I don't see the utilities 
as the place for the village to absorb that risk. Um, in regard to affordable rental, what we need is more rental housing. And I will say now, and I will continue to be working on, the village owns uh, 44 acres of glass farm. We have uh, not been doing anything with that for uh, however many long, however many years it has been since we bought that from Bob Altman <coughs> Sr. Uh, by starting to look at that property for development, that's one way that the village can both make money by selling property for development as well as creating a, a larger stock of rental housing, in particular affordable rental housing. So um, I will um, vote for this. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, I mean, I, I think the uh, discussion has continued to evolve and, and had different focuses. Uh, clearly, one issue that uh, has, has become sort of a central focus is affordability. So, I mean, I've, I've been thinking about it uh, a lot, and I come to a different conclusion than Lori, and I try to sketch out some of these ideas. I don't want to make it too long, but I think I probably need to review some of these. Um, all right, I think first of all, and, and I've said this kind of from the beginning of the discussion, um, what's challenging about this decision is that for every argument on one side, I think there's an equal counter argument. Um, you know, I heard a lot of people tonight talk about um, or make the assertion that this will disincentivize uh, economic development. But we've heard plenty of examples from communities that initiated this policy. Um, John's brought forward some things. Um, that counter that argument. Um, I mean, even some of the owners of properties that have recently bought them in Yellow Springs have mentioned that they don't see it that way. So I understand that some people do, but that feels like an opinion to me. I, I don't see any sort of facts that establish that. And I've talked to at least 10 communities, AMP communities, just to try to figure out how this transition worked. But to get back to affordability, um, I think one thing that we have to look at is the fact that if we do remain with the status quo, and I've said this before, that is going to mean an increase for everybody. And I, I struggle with the idea that uh, the majority of our citizens uh, agree with that, that everybody's bill should go up. And specifically in affordability, that means people that are already challenged to pay their bills are going to have to struggle with that. Um, we may talk about it as being a little bit, but conflated with the fact that we are necessarily going to be raising rates, every bit that we raise it is going to make it more of a challenge. Um, I, I do think it's important to look very carefully at Linda Rodolsky's email, because one of the things that she said, and it's very persuasive to me because she's in the field, she's dealing with folks that have these challenges, and she said, in my opinion, the landlords basically subcontract their tenants to pay the village utilities for their properties. And if their subcontractors fail to pay, then they, the landlords, need to pay. So, I mean, to me, that's clearly articulating support for this from somebody that's in the field who knows our community very well. The other thing I think is, is really important is to note uh, her mm -hmm. recommendation that uh, affordability, feasibility, uh, or affordable feasibleness can be uh, part of the application process. And this is something that Karen's mentioned several times, is this transparency. So that people actually know that besides whatever the rent is going to be, there's also currently a $200 deposit, plus utilities are gonna cost $150 a month or more, depending on your usage. Um, I guess that brings me to uh, the point that I feel like the costs for renters do not need to change. And this kind of gets to what Marianne raised, because I know a lot of it comes down to who should bear the risk. And I, I've already mentioned I'm uncomfortable with my discussions with a lot of citizens who sometimes come in with sort of the principle, you create those bills, you should pay them, but we're dealing with a practicality that does impact everybody in the village currently. And so what I think about here is that if we do have landlords, which I know we do, that um, accept the risks now of, uh, of renting to lower income individuals, 
that does not need to change. That is a risk, and risk tolerance is something that we all need to factor in. But with the village taking away the $200 deposit, it seems practical to me that that can be shifted. It should not have to increase the costs. Um, I, I'm, I think it's very compelling, the idea of incentivizing uh, investments in energy efficiency. And this is, again, something Karen's emphasized. I ended up reading a couple of the Ohio Supreme Court decisions that center around this. One of them is very informative. It talks about it's, it's based out of equal rights. And they mention most of the arguments that we've discussed here, that one of the side benefits when communities move towards this is that it does incentivize energy improvements, which lower utility costs overall. And that, I guess, rolls into, I don't think I'll go through all my 10 points, but the point that what we really need to think about are real solutions. One of those is how do we make sure that these utility bills um, are, can be controlled in some frame, frame or fashion. And I guess I'm also uh, thinking about the fact that we've talked, Marianne just mentioned it, utility assistance programs, things that I think will really turn affordability around. Uh, I just do not see any argument that is beyond an opinion that it's gonna affect affordability. And when I look at the commitment that many landlords have to uh, diversity in this community, I think again, if the village, the landlords, the renters, the community as a whole are working together, uh, we can achieve that goal. And it's not about this particular policy. The last thing that I wanna say is, um, and I mentioned this last time, is that it's very easy to pull out certain pieces, and I understand it's been confusing because this has been developed as we've deliberated and gotten lots of input, but if we look at this holistically, most of the concerns that I've heard have been addressed. I appreciate hearing Patty say that we will continue to improve it and to work together to collaborate on this issue. Because the bottom line, if you go back to what Linda Rudolsky said, if 30% of your income is supposed to be for rent and utilities, that means as a single person in Yellow Springs, you need to make at least 25,000. At $10 an hour full time, you're making 19,200 before taxes. I contend that we do not have affordability now, and again, we need to look at addressing this in different ways. So I like that we're tightening up the policy. I believe this will work. And ultimately, I like the fact that it's brought to everybody's attention how important this issue is. It was a goal that we talked about when Marianne and I were elected a year and a half ago, and I think we need to get serious about real uh, solutions. Thanks, Brian. Jerry? <clears throat> I just have two things. Uh, in terms of have we been listening, yes. Uh, one of the things that I did bring up in the last meeting was that we hold it off till January of 2016 to implement. We said yes. The, the, the second thing, if, if I'm correct, there was a question at the last meeting uh, if a landlord got stuck with a, with a high bill, could they make payments? And, and I think the answer was yes. Absolutely. to that also. So um, those were the two things that I, that I was pushing for. So. Um, well, I, I'll read part of what I wrote today and try to uh, try to speak a little bit to what's been said. Um, I um, am planning to um, vote no on this policy, and I don't want my vote to be seen as anything against the hard work of our staff. I think they're actually doing a great job of trying to gather every penny and really bring us to economic solvency. And we've been hit hard from a lot of different directions um, that make this work really difficult. And some of it's also just our own over the course of years, not charging enough for utilities. Um, we council and previous councils bear responsibility for that. Um, and my main concerns are for the supply of affordable rental units. I think there are some new pressures on housing rental units. Um, Airbnb is kind of an easy way to go in and out of having somebody in. And um, there's a lot of people who are using their extra spaces for tourist rental rather than for 
affordable unit rental. You can make a lot more money without having somebody there all the time, more on your own schedule. Um, and that's kind of a newer pressure, I think, because of things like Airbnb. So I think there's a lot of pressure on property owners to move away from affordable rent rental units that weren't necessarily even there that much 10 years ago. Um, and because the, the town is a very desirable place to own a home, if you can afford it, um, I think that pressure continues on anybody buying or selling a home that may have been a rental unit, um, that it's, it's just more likely that rental units keep getting turned over, especially if they're single family housing units, um, that they get turned over into, um, from rental into owner occupied. So those are some pretty big pressures that I think we're facing. And um, uh, really sort of drawing from conversations with uh, Sam and Sandy this past week, that when you buy a property, you're really thinking about risks. And there are a lot of, especially retirees, people on fixed income who are using rental properties as a kind of supplemental. And the more risky that gets, and the more, the more they feel like they are exposed, the less comfortable they're going to be owning that property. Um, and that may or may not be a good thing, but I think in some of those cases, we may lose some good landlords to who sell the properties, and again, they get turned into um, owner-occupied property. Um, and I'm concerned also that commercial properties become riskier, especially for things that don't have a good, an established track record, new energy, renewable energy, things that are a little bit like bug farming, things that are a little bit on the outside of what people are, are used to um, that may use a lot of utilities, that, that may, that's going to be a, a risk assessment that is going to be increased by um, by a, by a policy where their um, their failure is going to come on the village. We have used our utilities to support businesses, both in the hotel and for Antioch. Um, so we, there is a precedent for that. We certainly have used. Um, uh, we've we've also helped with building the home inc housing. So w through utility, if I recall correctly, that's how that was one of our in kind kind of ways of supporting the new houses on Cemetery Street. So we have um, done this, and especially getting back to the low income people, getting your utilities cut off, getting evicted from your home is a huge calamity in a family's life. And there is a social, um, there's, a, there's an argument that that cost should be borne more, at least some of that cost should be borne more socially. Um, so I do propose that all owner-occupied properties, commercial or residentials, would be guaranteed through property tax. Owners would, would have to prove that they're not owner-occupied. I would imagine a form that renters would have that would indicate clearly, because one of the problems Patty identified is that renters scrape together what they think they need for a deposit and then are surprised when they find out there's another deposit for the utilities, I mean, especially young people, people who are just getting started in the game of renting a place don't realize everything that, that is a part of it. So uh, setting that all out in a lease would be, I think, reasonable. Um, and I had said much bigger, I think we would just want to look at our deposits, make sure that they're in line with best practices. Um, Ellis Jacobs sent me, uh, said in an email to me today that there are uh, some other suggestions from uh, other agencies about how to go about getting uh, or securing uh, securing low-income uh, people 
He said, um, I'll just read what he wrote. Deposits, if they're too big, they can be a big barrier. Public utilities are limited to 130% of the average monthly bill. The OAC, um, the Ohio Administrative Code, lists a variety of other ways for a customer to provide security beyond deposits. So um, I, I would hope that we would, I would, I would like us to consider my proposal. I realize it sounds like my um, council, fellow council people's minds are made up and I understand. We have talked about this a long line, a long time. It feels like we're very far down the path. Um, but I feel I must um, make a motion that you consider my alternative proposal. I'll understand if it doesn't get a second, but I'm going to make the motion anyway, that all owner-occupied properties would be guaranteed through property tax as recommended by staff, but that rental units would revert to being on a deposit with some improvements to our policies related to rental units. So that's a motion. Do we have a second? Uh, I'll second it. Uh, I'm, discussion? I guess I'm a little confused here because we... I mean, what do we do? We, when, we've got two motions Chris, on the, no, this is a motion to amend. And so oh, I'm what sorry. happens, okay. yeah, so gotcha. this would amend, amend the policy. And I think it would amend it to the point where we would probably need it. You know, we would need it, would it to be re, re take it written. back, Take us back to square one, yeah. Um, um, but it, you do vote on an amendment to the policy, um, or okay. an amendment to any anything that's on the table. You vote, to, uh, vote on the amendment. And then if the amendment fails, you go back and then you have your vote on the original. So well, discussion? Let's, we should need you to, discuss? Well, we, I mean, the, the next process would be to have discussion on the amendment, correct? correct. So any discussion on the amendment? I don't have any discussion. Um, do we hear citizen comment? We can hear. We certainly Go, come can. Come on, Judith. <laughs> I, uh, Judith Templin. I know it's been discussed a long time. I think it's actually a really important policy, and. Um, um, I think uh, what Lori's talking about, I think it's excellent, and I think I think she's right. And I think maybe what council could do is table this discussion, or you know, have a discussion tonight, table a decision, so they so you have time to think about it, and um, bring it back. I know that sounds probably horrible, but I would recommend that. Any other discussion, Sam? We have, we are running into 7 o'clock. Um, we'll take two more comments and then we're going to take a vote. I'm going to make comments and we're going to take a vote. Hi, I'm Sam Young. My comment on Lori's proposal is yes. Bob, I said two more comments. Joe, I'm sorry, we okay. won't. Okay. I think everybody's position has been clearly outlined. I just want to say I don't see a downside to postponing this for 90 days. I say that because for years, like it or not, the utility department was not really organized and as efficient as it should have been. And I think now that scrutiny has applied to that department, I expect that the procedures will be tightened up and I fully expect in 90 days, the losses to be cut by at least 80%. And if it's anything close to that, this is a drastic overhaul. Thanks, Bob. That I don't think is necessary. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Okay. Um, if there isn't any, is there any discussion from council on the amendment? I just want to say one thing to uh, Bob Baldwin's point, which is that by delaying implementation to January 1st of next year, which was something that Joe Dunphy initially brought up, Jerry made that amendment. I think we all supported. We are effectively giving it more than 90 days. We are giving it six months. And just like this ordinance is changing, if, you know, again, we need to change the law because it's not working, that's what we'll do. That's what Patty said. Uh, are we ready to take a vote on the amendment? Mm -hmm. um, can we do a voice vote or should we do, we should do a roll call. Judy? Oh, sorry, I this thing in front of me. Sims? Uh, no to the amendment. McQueen? 
No. Housh. No. Asplund. Yes. Wintrow. No. Okay. Um, I'm going to make a few comments. I want to explain a little bit of my thinking on this and have some what I hope might be some positive changes. We've established that this discussion has been going on since December of 2014, so it has been discussed, it has been considered at length. Um, and while um, I don't feel that any of us are being led by anybody, um, I think we have a, a, an open relationship with staff. We talk back and forth. I don't feel like we're being led by anybody. But the fact that such a, such a strong percentage, a high percentage of municipalities have adopted this policy just proves that it's a, a fiscally sound policy. It, it doesn't mean that just because we're Yellow Springs, we have to do everything differently. I'm not going to hit every point that's been made, but I want to hit a few. Um, we've established that, that, uh, that the staff has tightened our process. We still aren't a for-profit utility entity. We're a non-profit profit, government-owned utility, and we've been given the option of holding property owners responsible by the state as a way that we can ensure, as a way to ensure that we can collect utility fees equitably across all user groups. Some landlords have said that council considers them wealthy, but that's not my view. I've been a landlord and I may be one again. I recognize that being a property owner is a challenging business with potential pitfalls. But at the end of the day, it is a business nonetheless that property owners go into with the intention of financial benefit, but the protection of tax deductions for all expenditures, investment, investments, and losses. Regarding affordability is about more than simply the rent. It's about the entire package of rent plus utilities. We've, Brian mentioned that, and I asked at a council meeting if landlords are telling their tenants how much their utility bills are. And, and it's pretty easy to find out what an average utility bill for a year has been. So tenants are going into this deal not knowing that they have to pay $200 a month deposit or a $200 deposit or what their monthly um, requirements are. So that is, that's not affordable. It's, it, it doesn't set up a, a, a sustainable process for, for tenants. Um, I think this legislation will allow for more collaboration between landlords and tenants regarding their utility usage. The tenants will have a clearer knowledge of what's required of them every month, and they can work with the landlord to be better stewards of their utilities. And the landlords will have the protection of a utility pot deposit that they can now collect as part of the lease agreement. Good energy stewardship can, further, can be further reinforced by encouraging property, property owners to make energy efficiency improvements to their property. The current system of tenants paying the utility bills doesn't incentivize the landlord to make energy improvements because they won't see a financial benefit. If landlords bear ultimate responsibility for utility payments, they can pay for those energy improvements through, through the utility savings they will realize. And at the same time, they will be making the village more affordable for more people because they're reducing the overall cost of living in the village. In this regard, I would like to work with the Energy Board staff and Efficiency Smart to see how we can further incentivize building and energy improvements to reduce the cost of living for everyone. Reducing our carbon footprint has been a value of council for years, and this legislation, along with the kind of financial support I am suggesting, is a significant step to doing just that. In terms of its impact on business, I consider this, legis this legislation neutral, since we have many more renters than property owners. I spoke with ep economic development officials in Fairborn and Xenia and a few city managers, and none of them viewed this policy as unfriendly to business or in any way hampering their ability to attract business. And we have found no indication from other communities that rents have increased for either commercial or residential, as property owners have promised would happen. At the suggestion of the landlords, many accommodations have been made to this legislation, holding off until, until 2016. Um, and the, the landlords do not have to take the bill. I mean, it, everything can stay the same. The tenants can continue to pay the bills just as they have been. Would, and I would assume, especially in commercial leases where we're talking about maybe 25,000 in, in electric every month, that they will continue. But at the end of the day, it will be the property owner's responsibility. Um, this has been a 
very difficult discussion and decision for me, especially since I have found myself on the opposite side of friends and colleagues. Certainly my personal views and professional expertise inform my work on council, but I was elected to make decisions that are in the best interest of the entire village. At the end of the day, I support this legislation for that reason. Um, are we ready to take the vote? Judy, would you call the vote? Yes. McQueen. Yes. Housh. Yes. Askland. No. Sims. Yes. Wintrow. Yes. Okay. Um, we will adjourn now and we'll probably take about a five minute break before we go into the work session um, about uh, sidewalks. We need a motion. Motion to adjourn. So move. I misunderstood. I thought you were No. no. Um, oh, sorry. sorry. We have to vote. So move. Oh, that's right. Oh, second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, let's, uh, we're going to call the meeting. The work session, do we call a work session yes, to order? Yes, we do. Call we do. a work session to order, okay. Um, and let's go ahead, and John, actually, maybe just hang out there for a second. We'll go ahead and um, call the roll. Which room? Here. Asplund. Yes. Jeez. Sorry, something. Okay. Uh, John, back. he did something weird. Sims? Here. House? Here. McQueen? Here. Great, that is. Okay, so this is our first work session. And uh, what a work session is, is a little bit more relaxed format to have a meeting. Um, we cannot make decisions, it will be discussion only. Um, we also, at the end of the meeting, um, have folded in um, uh, reports on council boards and commissions. Um, and the topic that we um, chose for our first work session is uh, discussion on sidewalks um, that, uh, and John has prepared a, John Young, our assistant village manager and planner has prepared a report for us. Oh, petitions do, and Do you want me to go over? Um, yeah, why don't you go ahead and take a couple minutes to go over those, sorry about Two that. Two seconds. Uh, so Dan West wrote the police department thanking them for help with children bike hikes at Mills Lawn School. John Young had a, a note in regarding our lovely international fellows who are going to be doing a presentation on Thursday, May 28th, so next week, 7 to 9 p.m. in the community, John Bryan, anybody know yeah, the room it's gonna be. It is gonna be in rooms A and B. And do we have just one minute to let them explain what they're going to talk about? Okay. I think so. Yes, Thank you. please. Um, so basically there are four main points. Can you um, introduce yourself? Okay. Because a few people might not have been here <laughs> okay. before. Hi, everyone. My name is Rati. Um, I'm here with another fellow from Malaysia, Nadia. I'm from Indonesia, by the way. Um, so yeah, on May 28th, uh, we will have a final presentation. And I'm going to talk briefly about the outline of presentation. There are four main points. We will first we will discuss about um, the introduction to our home country. So I will briefly discuss about Indonesia and Jakarta in particular. And uh, similar with Nadia, we'll talk um, shortly about Malaysia. And second, we will discuss about our project here in Yellow Springs, um, including the new village website and the Facebook page, also um, the web use and social media guideline. And third, uh, we will discuss about the takeaway, the key takeaway from our fellowship program here, where uh, Nadia will um, talk about the renewable energy and I will talk about the senior secondary education. And lastly, we will have a community feedback with a Q&A session with the forum here. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, before uh, John starts, is there a way to regulate the temperature? I would yeah, be more I just turned relaxed the if it AC. were not as cold as it is. Oh, it was super hot, so I turned yeah. it back. Oh, I can turn it back. <laughs> Because I have the power. So do, yeah. Let's so you do How many people are halfway between? Like, I'm freezing. Okay. Okay. I'm okay, but. Uh, one more thing, it, it's already been mentioned, but Melissa Van Zandt will be having the Understanding Your Bill seminar, and there's a good handout in the packet. And that's May 20th, 2.30 to 3.30, and it will be filmed, assuming we can get that to work out. 
so other people can tune in. Uh, oh, and okay. I could not find the efficiency smart summary results. Maybe I. Um, I was going to put them in the next packet. Oh, okay. So we could have more time to discuss. Okay. Oh, you great. put them in there. I thought I did. Yeah, they were in the paper packet. Okay. They were in mine. Yeah. I don't think not it online. was in the online packet. Okay. Okay. And actually, I think I forgot to look for Susan's report. And I'm very embarrassed. And to and say. maybe that can be reviewed during during. Um, Commission and I guess I, I got totally I love this agenda to get totally away from me by having John stand there because we actually are doing let me go back and ask if there are any other announcements are we taking care of all the announcements okay and we actually do include citizens concerns in um, the work session we just decided again that if there was a, a something on the mind of a citizen that we didn't want them to have to wait for a month especially if they'd come to a meeting specifically to um, express that concern so this would be about anything um, that is not on this agenda um, which would be sidewalks or commission reports okay um, seeing none then we will go on to new business which is the sidewalk update and recommendations from John Young Thank you. Hello. Hi, and you guys know me. I'm John Young, <laughs> assistant village manager for the village. Um, so a couple months ago, I was tasked with uh, preparing a report on the village's sidewalks, and I've been working very closely with our superintendents of streets, Jason Hamby and finance director Melissa Manzant, and uh, Chris Connard, our, our village solicitor, as well as many other people, and have compiled this uh, report for you guys to review. It was in your packets. Um, the presentation that I'm going to present to you is going to basically be an abbreviation of that. I uh, kind of want to get to the meat of the, uh, of the study and, and then we can have some discussions from there and questions. So basically, um, start us off with the brief history, uh, overview of where we're going to be talking about, uh, looking at brief history, looking at some comparisons of regula different regulations that are out there looking at our village's existing sidewalk conditions and looking at different policy options. Uh, some case studies kind of uh, relating to those policy options, uh, funding options that were related to that as well, some analysis, and then an uh, overview of what our next steps could be uh, as the sidewalk discussion moves forward. Uh, so just a brief history of sidewalks. I'm, this is basically a summarization of the first couple of pages of the report, uh, so it doesn't go into as much detail. Um, sidewalks um, were, were installed as a, as a method of delineating uh, pedestrian ways from the street activity. Uh, prior to the existence of sanitary sewer lines, or the invention of sanitary sewer lines, and other uh, improvements, the street was oftentimes where lots of bad stuff would just kind of be accumulating. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's a really great book uh, called City Form by Emily Town that actually goes into details about why streets uh, are the width that they are and how there's a public sanitary uh, hazard associated with having narrower streets. So, sidewalks were developed as a way to separate the pedestrian from the street traffic and to allow clear and free access for people who are walking. Uh, to and from their residences to businesses that are that were close by. The other thing I want to talk about is that the predominant mode of transportation for all of human uh, civilization up until 100 years ago was walking. So we are by nature uh, a bipedal uh, species and we walk everywhere and uh, it has only been recently with the advent of the automobile where our lives have become more centered around the automobile. Uh, but that trend, um, as in, illustrated in the report, seems to be reversing um, these days. So uh, sidewalks provide a domain exclusively for, de for pedestrians. They uh, separate pedestrians from uh, traffic. Uh, so some more modern uh, applications for sidewalks is to make sure that, side that when sidewalks are installed, let's say, along a busy road, uh, that the people are not walking in that road. Um, if anyone has ever walked in a, uh, like, the area around Beaver Creek Mall where it doesn't have many sidewalks. I can tell you that it's a very uncomfortable walk. Um, the other thing is that, uh, so the safety is, the, is, the, is one of the key issues of sidewalks. The other one is that it provides access to the public. 
uh, historically, the way the properties were delineated uh, up until just after World War II was that uh, the common understanding was that the property owner owned into the center line of the streets. And when a developer would come in and buy a section, a lot, let's say a, a subdivision of, of, a, of a plat of a village, uh, that would be subdivided and then developed into housing. Uh, when the developer develops that, they develop the, uh, the street infrastructure, the improvements, the public improvements, is what they're called, and then that is later dedicated uh, to the municipality. So sidewalks actually ended up becoming someone that's something that's somewhat of a realm of uh, between the public and the private. Um, providing sidewalk path access, uh, improved property values, and pri improved access to, to streetcars and to business districts uh, historically and was seen as a benefit for that uh, historically. As uh, after World War II, as development shifted towards the automobile, sidewalks became less important uh, to development, so a lot of places around the country just stopped putting sidewalks in. Um, obviously, in, in the village, there's a delineation of different types of streets, including the state streets, where sidewalks are not required, and then most si developments do require sidewalks. Uh, the other thing Can is that... Can you define it, estate streets, please? Um, <clears throat> word for word, top of my head, I, uh, is basically uh, streets that are designed to have a more of a low, uh, more of a rustic uh, feel to them. They're not intended to have heavy traffic on them. Um, they don't have sidewalks to kind of evoke more of a rural uh, Feeling and, Aren't and they generally wider, John? They are generally wider, yes. So, so can you give an example in the Elmer's Plain? Of an estate street. Ooh. Like President, a, President, 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 yeah. Rice, Rice, Rice Road, Spalon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. A lot of them in the south side Although of the Spallon village are, are, are estate style. So you know, if you take a drive around there, you'll, you'll see a lot of I actually ran down President the other day and was in the street. <laughs> uh, the other thing is that is provided access to the public. We talked about that. Um, so on to the next slide. So our dis sidewalk discussion in the village, uh, from what I have, the materials I have uh, been given and been able to find, most of the most active discussion started around the mid 2000s in the village. Um, in the late 2000s, then uh, assistant village planner at Amrine uh, developed the uh, a couple of di different documents. One is the uh, sidewalk survey, which is the graphic on the screen here, and the other one is the other one in your packet, which is a conditions report. Um, then uh, village manager Mark Cundiff, uh, in recommended in 2011 that uh, village council uh, remove language from the existing sidewalk ordinance holding property owners responsible. And one of the uh, key recommendations in doing that from him was that uh, he believed that the village should treat uh, sidewalks as part of street infrastructure and that the, uh, the sidewalk policy would, well, first off, the, it was stated that the village could handle the uh, maintenance of sidewalks. The second thing that was stated was that um, sidewalk budget would be determined every budget year. So, since 2011, we looked at some of that budget. 2011, when the village adopted uh, responsibility for sidewalks by removing the language, they uh, devoted $30,000 to sidewalk repair. In 2013, the village wanted to invest $60,000 over the course of five years to repair sidewalks, but the actual budget only allowed 50000 which covered the streets uh, a couple blocks on Xenia Avenue. Uh, because of cutbacks, uh, our current, we're currently budgeted at zero dollars <coughs> for sidewalk repair. So the village is not funding sidewalk repair at this moment. Uh, our regulations uh, are spelled out in the subdivision regulation, section 1226.06A3. A minimum of four foot size <coughs> wide sidewalks will be installed at least one side of the street for new public streets. There is an option to substitute blacktop for concrete, and state streets are exempt from sidewalk requirements unless they're required by the Planning Commission. Can I <coughs> go ahead? Back to this estate street. It's the word I can't find the word estate street in our like zoning code. It's in our subdivision regulations. 
which okay. are which is like the which first is, part of is so that zoning in the code zoning is code? chapter twelve forty ish to like oh, okay. twelve ninety nine. Uh -huh. But everything before that, like chapter twelve twenty six, is in our subdivision regulations. So our subdivision regulations um, dictate how the village de handles replatting, uh, subdividing of lots for minor subdivisions or major subdivisions. And like if a property developer, like for example, with uh, the Birch development were to approach the, the village and say, I want to build a bunch of houses, they need to get that approved by planning commission. Uh, and part of, that, part of that process is presenting what type of streets they're going to build. Mm -hmm. So that is, is a formal application to the planning commission. Right. And isn't in the comp plan, isn't there a, del a delineation of the different kinds of streets, like feeder streets mm -hmm. and main arteries? Is the state streets included in the, the comp plan? Uh, the comp plan identifies the standardized highway classification of, of streets and roads. So you have arterial, collector, subcollector, local roads. Uh, state streets are, not, are identified as local roads in local the comprehensive roads, okay. plan. Right, because that it isn't a term that I. So mm -hmm. obviously, I I um, wasn't putting the zoning code together with that other part. Yep. I don't think it fits very well with our the, even the existence of a state street really don't fit very well with our current comp plan or our mm -hmm. current zoning code to state that all right but we have them so yeah <laughs> and the, I'm so, glad to some know. of the things that we want to talk about is how we want to move forward with this so mm -hmm. that's good to have the American Planning Association has a, has a paper uh, on their website about recommended street standards uh, they recommend a four-foot minimum width for local residential streets eight feet for commercial streets and 12 feet for downtown business districts um, just for reference, Xenia Avenue is about 10 to 11 feet in most areas for sidewalk width. So that's a comparison. Uh, the big one, though, is Americans with Disabilities Act, which was passed in 1990. Uh, this basically changed the game as, as far as how uh, accessibility is regulated in the country. Um, and also re re regarding sidewalks, how sidewalks are constructed. So the ADA. Uh, recommends that a minimum of five feet be provided for wheelchair turning radiuses. Now, that does not mean that you need to have five feet for the entire width of the sidewalk, but you do need to have a turning island, which is spaced every 200 feet in order to be compliant with ADA standards. Uh, you can have a minimum of three foot width sidewalks, um, which some of our sidewalks in the village are three feet wide. Um, and you can also have them around obstacles. So if you have uh, conditions where you have utility poles or fire hydrants or something like that, and, or street trees in the, uh, in the way, the, the sidewalk can go around those and still be three feet wide. Uh, and then also the big thing that a lot of municipalities are kind of facing right now is appropriately designed curb ramp assemblies for intersections. Those are something that every, every uh, place has been struggling to put in uh, since then. So our existing condition of sidewalks, this is the other, um, the other map I was talking about. This is the condition sidewalk uh, map that uh, Ed did. It is not very clear on this presentation. Um, this was scanned at the maximum DPI, so, uh, but there's a copy of it in your report that's a lot, a lot larger. So we have 17.2 miles of linear sidewalk in the village at approximately 90,784 feet. We don't have all of our curb ramp connections completed. So we do have areas where the sidewalk ends at the intersection and there's usually like a, a sewer grade or something and uh, there's, there's sidewalk across the street but there's no way for handicap accessibility with that connection. So we also have some areas that are not connected. So if you go back to, the, uh, to this map, you see that we have the green is sidewalk on both sides. Um, you see that there's, there's some red, which is like one side where it is not uh, connected to areas that are in the south side of the town or on the on far, like this area right here on the, far, on the west side of town. So we have some missing connections as and well. yellow is what? Yellow is no sides. There's no. Yeah, no sidewalk. Okay, and it's sort of hard to see. On. <clears throat> yeah. Um, one of the things that uh, is kind of jumping ahead, but we're, we're looking at buying a, uh, purchasing a, a geographical information, information system software, which would allow us to recreate this map with better colors and better information. So that's something that is in the pipeline. Excuse uh, me, John. So essentially anything that doesn't have a red or a blue is in yellow and it's just difficult to see. 
Yes. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So it is the, one of the three colors. The key colors that you want to look at for sidewalks are red and the green, blue. The black is alleys. So those. Oh, those okay. I was wondering what I was that was confusing. Yeah. Oh. So anyway, we're working on on on. Uh, oh yeah. So what I was going to say was. One key distinction I want to make is that when the village council adopted the policy, it was the understanding of council when they adopted, according to the minutes, that it only applied to maintaining the existing sidewalk infrastructure. So this report does not look at expanding our sidewalk infrastructure at this time. However, if that's the direction council wants to go in, we can investigate that and find out where we can do, uh, where we can do sidewalks and how we would do that. So anyway, moving back to the other. So we have nine kind of <coughs> Okay, so we we're looking at the at different options. We came up with three diff distinct options. The first one would be the village would find a way to finance the sidewalk program. Would be existing sidewalk to meet the ADA requirements for, for handicap accessibility. So we got ninety thousand, roughly ninety one thousand square feet. I mean, excuse me, linear feet of sidewalk that translates to a square footage of about 393,094. And that was derived by basically looking at the four foot, taking, we took a 1,000 foot section of sidewalk. And every 200 feet, we put the five by five square. And then I averaged that width. So it's not completely four, it's not completely five. But I added about a third of foot more to account for commercial streets and to account for uh, basically what would be considered contingency funding on a project like this. So if we have a situation where there are street trees, uh, where maybe a rubber sidewalk implementation might be a better solution, or using some sort of creative solution that could require a little bit more money, we would be able to have the financing to go in there and do that. So, John, go ahead. Um, but my understanding is that according to the ADA, we could have three foot sidewalks. That's correct. With the five yeah. foot turn around every two hours. But, but you figured it four feet? Four feet because our regulations say four feet. And most of the best practices guides say four feet as well. Uh, in general, wider is better. Uh, but if you want to look at three feet, that's the discussion. Yeah, I think there are reasons to look at three feet. Of course, one is expense. Another mm -hmm. is the material that we use for sidewalks isn't all that sustainable. It uses a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. If we continue to use concrete cement, and there is an appendix with some different types of material yes, for sidewalks. Yes, so. thank you. Yeah, we can talk about that too. It's pretty cool. So currently, the square footage is based on four foot plus five foot every 200 feet. We can look at a three foot plus five foot as well. Uh, the cost per square foot is $12. That's from the previous village uh, streetscape bid, which is pretty accurate up to last year. Um, the cost for sidewalk repair and maintenance, just sidewalks in general, before four million seven or seventeen thousand dollars, roughly. Uh, the next section we add in the uh, total amount of crosswalk ramp crossings. So I went and looked at the map uh, of sidewalks and delineated how many intersection crosswalks we would need to install. Uh, those uh, have cost the village in the past roughly, on average, six hundred dollars. So the total cost to put in just the sidewalk ramps actually is 98,400. So you add that in there and you arrive at the four, the $4.8 million figure that's, that's right down here. So this is the, uh, the, the rough cost of replacing all the sidewalks to make them uh, ADA accessible. Uh, there was a couple of municipalities where- I'm sorry, I, Go ahead. I think I'm, you said replacing all the sidewalks. That's correct. Pulling up everything that exists mm -hmm. basically. Replacing them and doing the five. Yes, and okay. that is calculated. That will further on. We look at the five year or ten year or thirty year, but it is basically a total cost to cover the thirty year costs because the the uh, average lifespan of a sidewalk is between twenty five and thirty years. So this is looking at if we have village sidewalk that is installed today, twenty five thirty years from now, it will need to be replaced. So we'll have to replace it anyway. So that cost is included. Um, there are a couple examples uh, of municipalities that have adopted responsibility for sidewalks. The biggest one right now is Los Angeles, California, uh, which is responsible for uh, sidewalks near street trees, uh, uh, primarily, but 
they were in the 1970s, um, they changed their legislation to, adopt, to have um, responsibility for sidewalks because they were getting federal grant money for it. So they got federal grant money for, <clears throat> for a couple of years. That funding dried up in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, so basically they were stuck with the system where they have attempted several ballot initiatives to raise the sales tax or raise an income tax and uh, have none of those have been passed. Recently, actually last month, uh, the city was named in a, in a lawsuit, an ADA lawsuit, and uh, the city settled out of court on the lawsuit to comply with ADA standards from the city. They're going to fund $1.3 billion of sidewalk repairs over the next 30 years. However, uh, as the article that I mentioned in the, re in, the, in the links and resources at the end of the report states, funding for this has not yet been identified by the city. So uh, one of the big challenges with Los Angeles has been funding. Uh, another one is Austin, Texas, which accepted maintenance responsibility for sidewalks in the 1990s. Uh, they require developments to, new developments to have sidewalks and was resulted as basically a patchwork of sidewalks. So in the last couple of years, they've uh, adopted this regulation called a fee in lieu, which basically the developer can elect to not have sidewalks if they pay the city uh, the cost of the sidewalks. And the city would then install sidewalks somewhere else in the community. So it would, they, they see it as a way to basically allow the city's neighborhoods to have better connections to existing sidewalks instead of having a new development that has sidewalks that go nowhere. So that is an option that, kind of, that was kind of brought up in Austin. They've been developing sidewalk plans. There's one in 2008. There's a new one just got uh, released uh, earlier, this, actually last year. Uh, kind of outlines their strategy to connect with uh, the city, uh, the, the different parts of that, uh, their sidewalk infrastructure. So, but one of the things that has kind of has dogged Austin as well as uh, Los Angeles is their funding levels are not sufficient to address sidewalk plan implementation. If you look at the report, uh, they are budgeting. Uh, about five to ten million dollars per year on sidewalks, and their report, their sidewalk plan, calls for a, uh, a total maintenance cost of 120 million dollars for existing, and 824 just to connect those those pl those pieces together. So these are larger examples, but because of economies of scale, uh, it can it ties a little bit for it ties into what the village is looking at as well. The next option uh, would be to return responsibility to the property owners um, for sidewalk maintenance, basically reestablishing the sentence that was, was uh, removed in 2011. Uh, I would not recommend just doing that wholeheartedly and just saying, here, you guys take it. Um, kind of like passing around a hot, hot potato. I, but I would recommend or I'll, I'll have council explore the opportunity to if they go this route to develop a policy or plan where we can offer some, some, some sort of program that would allow sidewalk uh, property owners who are interested in repairing the sidewalk or have damaged sidewalk to uh, basically piggyback on a village concrete bid or have some level of cost sharing. Uh, we are willing to explore those options. Uh, note under this option though, we would still be responsible for curb ramps and also curbs as infrastructure. So we would still be replacing curbs, we'd still be putting the curb ramps in. Those are, those are, are pretty important connections. Um, so the case study here would be Dallas, Texas, uh, which I have a brochure in your, in your report. Uh, they developed a, two programs. One is called a Fix It First program, where uh, the property owner can piggyback on the city's concrete bid for a discounted price. Uh, it expedites the repair price process. And it also includes a one-year warranty. So this, so basically, they, they sign up for this program, they get the fee, they pay it. The village, con uh, the city contractor comes out, installs the sidewalk to city specifications, and also guarantees it with a one-year warranty. Now, they, for the cost sharing, and maybe for the fixed first, I have to look into this. They also include, <coughs> include driveway aprons, which I found very interesting. They include. I'm sorry. Driveway aprons. I, I think that they driveway need to pay. aprons. I think yeah. they'll yeah. do it, but I think that the yes owners have to pay. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's correct. Yes. Right. Um, so it could be included as a part of the project, but they would have still have to pay the cost for that. And the other one is cost sharing, where the city would pay 50% of the sidewalk repairs. It is a first come, first serve program. 
and it does have it, it does take one and a half to three years in a time frame and they're very upfront about that so. but but on the fix fast fix program mm -hmm. the homeowner still pays the contractor yes okay right so it's just on the village bid or the city bid but it's they still pay the contractor directly yes that's okay. correct and it's through an existing price agreement okay And then there's policy option C, which is just keeping things the same. Um, I estimate that with the cost of inflation, even if we increased our, our budget off of $50,000 with inflation uh, to kind of average things out, it would take approximately 96 years to replace all the sidewalks in the village. Uh, that coupled with the, uh, the possibility that we would face increased uncertainty regarding legal and insurance liability uh, for trip hazards and any other type of uh, sidewalk damages that people would may maybe may fall on to. Um, the condition of the sidewalks under this option would deteriorate faster than our ability to repair them. And that's actually what's happening right now. So of the three options, I would recommend we do not go with this one. <laughs> and I think that's why we're having this conversation now. So we look at, we go from the options, we now go to funding. Because funding is, is a big component of all this. And we've talked a little bit about some of the funding options already. The first one is the village would, uh, village council can decide to put a tax levy on the ballot for up to five years to cover the cost of replacing the, uh, the sidewalk infrastructure. Um, we do have the millage for, the, for what the cost would be. Um, it did not make the report, it would just be for the, for the amount that I specified in the report, it would be uh, 10.20 mills generate $1 million per year for over five years, which costs the owner $100,000 property about $357 a year to do a five-year levy at $4.8 million. Uh, so it's expensive. The second one would be to increase taxes. Are those numbers in the report? No, they anyone? did not make the report because they came after I submitted oh. it. Would you say that number again? It is 10.20 mills, which would generate $1 million a year for five years, so $5 million. It would cost the owner of a $100,000 property about $357 a year. That's for a $100,000 property? That's correct. Most of which are? More, far higher. Yeah, so more would be like 600 357 357 for $100,000 yeah. property, yes. Mm -hmm. that's so if you have a $200,000 house. Like about yeah. 500 probably. Yeah. So that came from the auditor's office. So that is the information on the tax levy. Um, the second option would be to increase taxes another way through uh, either raising property taxes or income tax to fund sidewalk repair and replacement. Uh, the third option would be to issue bonds. Uh, however, when you want, when when you look at issuing bonds, you want you're looking trying to look at ways to recoup the revenue that uh, to raise the to raise revenue. Excuse me to cover the cost of financing the bonds. Which uh, with sidewalks, there's very little uh, improvement there's in, in that to to justify financing bonds. So you could do it maybe as part of a tax increase, um, but Overall, it's probably not the best solution. And then the last one is the fee and lieu fee, which we talked about earlier with Austin, Texas, that we could do as well. Um, if we return the maintenance to the property owner, uh, we can do a sidewalk assessment. Uh, that is something that was actually explored in detail by, the, uh, by Ed Amrine, the, the previous uh, village planner. Uh, he had basically uh, had an entire report that, that kind of went down this, this, uh, this path uh, we would look at that, at that again more closely and find out what, what are some ways we can balance that with some incentives. Uh, the second one is a self-assessed property tax. Uh, that would be where the owner would voluntarily assess their own property, uh, property tax increase by block. Um, wasn't that explained very well in the literature that I was reading, so um, if you are interested, I can delve deeper into that and find out what, what the pros and cons are for it. And then finally, we have the cost sharing with the property owner, uh, which has actually been undertaken by a lot of other municipalities who uh, have the property owner responsible for the sidewalk. 
Uh, Chicago, it didn't list in here, but they actually have a bid where the property owner pays $4 per square foot, which is substantially lower than the 12 that we quoted earlier. As, and that was part of the Chicago concrete bid. So there are opportunities possibly for cost sharing through using uh, a general contractor with uh, the municipality. But is the $4 what they pay or it's a share of what they pay. It's what it's what the, the, the property owner what, pays. But is it what the contract no, is? It's no. a 50 50 thing. 50 /50, so it's more like okay. eight. Okay. Um, and they change it every year. So it's not a straight four. Right. They said so in their program, they said but this year is. They've got economies dollars. of scale. So they're exactly. getting concrete for. There's a lot of sidewalk than, in Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, it's similar to, the, to our street paving program that we yeah. do with Greene County. I mean, mm -hmm. And did you only see examples of 50 50 splits? I saw an example of 75 25 split actually. Okay. Which way? Um, yeah, which, I think it's San Diego. And but which, which, which direction? Who pays 75? 75? The, the municipality pays 75 and the owner pays 25. Hmm. And I can look more in detail at that because that was pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, and I, I think self assessed property owner tax I'd like to understand better. Cool. Yeah. I, that, that was vague, yeah, like you said. Yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming, though, John, if, if I'm assuming that a cost sharing split could go at any right. percentage, any that percentage, count, yes. council could, you could do a, would want third, to do. like a two thirds, one third, half, half, three quarters, one quarter, three fifths, two fifths. And it sounded like from the Dallas example mm -hmm. that they just kind of appropriate money at different periods and then you apply. Yeah, and you, they have a, a window. They have this is how much money we've, we've appropriated this year, and then those people get in as a group. So they have a group pool and that's when, so like, for example, if I owned property and I wanted to uh, be, you know, I had bad sidewalks and I wanted to be a part of the program, it would, that's why it says one and a half to three years because they have to appropriate the budget for that. And maybe they don't get all of the budget in the first year so it kind of goes to the second and third year and it goes down the list. Mm -hmm. So we could have, an, uh, you know, through that program we would have an, a long list of people who need sidewalk replacements, but, the, but they would be, financed every year so you would have improvements being made over time so eventually sidewalks are replaced through the program did they have any any statistics of how many people are taking which option and how many sidewalks are actually being paid for completely by the homeowners i did not see any of that but i can contact them and talk to them about that and see where I mean, where it's at like to know i mean yeah. if there is anybody actually doing it mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like they, they seem to have a, some a, some of a waiting list, but is the process the same the same thing as that? Is the process too cumbersome or too long long time frame to uh, to be effective? So I, that's a question I like to ask the people in Dallas. So and do that. they have do they have a, an option of somebody just going out and hiring their own contractor, or do they try to keep the specifications controlled? You know, I think they probably <clears throat> would be able to entertain both. But I think in order to get it through the through the municipality's contract, you have to go through their program. Right. Well, I understand that. But if but if but if, if, I, had a, if I had a contractor who came in and did it, yeah. So for example, um, in Bellevue, where I used to work, people would re apply to re to replace their sidewalks. Excuse me. And we actually had a form. We didn't charge a permit fee for it, but we had our building inspector look at the sidewalk and our public works director look at the sidewalk to make sure it complied with our regulations. So we had to look at it before they poured and make sure that they had it meet, meeting the, the proper depth and thickness. And then after it was poured, we did a final inspection on that. So go ahead. <clears throat> but uh, in Dallas, the, the, I think part of the question that Karen was asking was, if someone hires their own contractor, then the city probably doesn't pay any part of it. You have True. to go through their mm -hmm. program. Right. Correctly. You have to go through their program, yes. And questions. John, just to be clear on Dallas, so are these programs, is this under an ordinance that's voluntary or mandatory to repair sidewalks? Or did you check yet? I haven't checked yet, okay. but I can look at it. I know that it's probably, a, like most ordinances, probably a mandatory, but yeah. I will double check that and make sure. Yeah, and you know, there isn't any inf information in here about, you know, being cited and what the right. whole regulatory process mm -hmm. is for you know how somebody gets to the point where they replace their sidewalk and one of the other things that we didn't get into this report in time is actually we're doing a survey of ohio municipalities to find out what they do as well so we've gotten some emails already uh, with their sidewalk programs and what their policies are so we've taken that into consideration as the discussion moves, moves along so there's a lot of information out there mm -hmm. 
And then finally, uh, both. Options that are good for both uh, really is just grant funding. Um, we actually have applied and received a Safe Route to School grant that uh, should be, is moving forward right now, but should be. Oh, did we, we that are was, receiving that? Mm-hmm. Yes. 20, is it 2017? 2016. I, 2016 right? I actually, yeah, I actually had an update from Tom Arnold today. Um, mm. Tom Arnold is with ODOT. And um, they actually are revising the right of way plan so that there's less right of way uh, acquisition, acquisition required, which means that we'll be able to bid it out in you know ourselves without going through ODOT, um, and that saves us some money. Oh, good. So um, it is moving forward. So. And that should come in, do we? <coughs> next year yeah the sidewalks themselves will be in next year we hope to do he says that um, he believes if everything moves forward um, that we should be able to proceed with right-of-way acquisition in late summer of this year can we have um, a map that shows a, shows us where the safe routes to school yes um, I can tell you it's it's pretty simple it comes uh, where the crosswalk is at Fa uh, Fair Acres and um, Fair, uh, Fairfield, Fairfield yep. Yellow Springs. Um, it comes from there. Um, down to winter? East, east to winter and down winter to Pleasant, correct, Jason? And it'll connect to the existing sidewalk at Pleasant, Winter Street at Pleasant Street. And it's not starting at Stafford? No, we are going, we as the, in the village, are we'll on our it. own, take it the rest of the way to Stafford. That was what we agreed to with ODOT. So it will run from there. The Safe Route, it's not part of the Safe Routes to School project, but we're going to do it at the same time. Cool. And, and are those, the sidewalks then, the, the north-south sidewalks to Mills Lawn, are those, all con, are those all solid or are there breaks in those sidewalks? I mean, the sidewalks that are taking the kids to Mills Lawn, mm -hmm. are there breaks in those At sidewalks? At that point, there should be a sidewalk all the way to Mills Lawn okay. once that's done, right, Brian? Yeah, there's no breaks, um, but we probably need to look at, you know, some spots are not very good, especially when you get uh, to Jailhouse Suites right before that mm -hmm. section. So, you know, there would be some patches, but it is continuous. Okay. I forget which street, but there was a street up in that area where there w I did observe some at intersection, there weren't any uh, crosswalk ramps, so mm -hmm. that's something that we would also have to look at. But I think the route from Winter is good. I think, I'm, I'm thinking of Walnut, I think, is where there are some missing sections for at the intersections. So, mm -hmm. so anyway, uh, Safe Routes to School, uh, we applied and received that grant, and that's in process right now. Uh, however, that, as we all have, are aware, is a very long time frame to go from approval to installation. Um, so we could continue to apply for Safe Routes to School funding for either new sidewalk construction or maintaining sidewalks um, in the future as long as the program is still around. Uh, the second option is the Community Development Block Grant funds, uh, which we actually received some last year for installing curb ramps in downtown Yellow Springs uh, as part of uh, the county application. So we can continue to kind of take it from that angle and see if we can get some more curb ramps if, in the future if that opportunity uh, presents itself. However, it's hard for us to apply on our own as uh, our median income is about $60,000 a year, which uh, usually prohibits us from getting uh, qualifying for that type of grant. But they will readily fund the curb ramps, right? Because it's of the ADA mm -hmm. compliance? Where's your... They're still based quite a bit on, um, on um, income, median household income. The only way that you can really get around that in a, a CDBG grant is if you kind of like section off the village into parcels where, and then do income surveys for each one mm -hmm. to show that they're, um, that they're different. And so some, some areas would qualify. So maybe loss in place, for instance, mm -hmm. would correct. We that might be able to potentially be focus one, on, yes. yes. Yeah. Focus okay. on the areas yes. where there are low income Mm -hmm. pockets in the village and Correct. work you on can do that. In fact, areas. I did that very thing in Williamsburg. Okay. You know, I've also been told that there's, when, when I went to an MVRPC meeting um, when we were doing this, the streetscape project, and 
everybody asked me, I talked to a bunch of ODOT people, they could not believe we had not submitted for grants for the streetscape, for the sidewalk, oh, for absolutely. the streetscape project. That's, and that's, yeah. So I do think that there probably is, you know, maybe more grant money out there that we could, that we could find. Well, this, this, the ODOT money for, is for streetscapes. It is, I mean, that's what funded the, the street five block streetscape I did in Williamsburg was ODOT money. Um, so it is for streetscapes like in downtown and, business areas. And that is certainly <laughs> not income. That's not income it's dependent. Not income I mean, either. I can tell you the amount of money oh that I gosh. see going past MVRPC right. for Fairborn, for Centerville, I mean, right. every city, Xenia. Mm -hmm. Xenia got money for all of their downtown signage. I mean, there is, there is a lot of money going out of ODOT for funding. How did we not and that includes sidewalks. Apply for that. Sidewalks, street yeah. trees, everything. You know. yeah. That was so. never even brought up. That's what I recall. Yep. Hmm. Anyway, we, there are other Touching opportunities for funding. We'll continue to seek them out and find them as new programs are developed and available. Um, there's been, uh, on the federal level, MAP 21 is due to expire this year, so unless they kick the can down the road Would with you an extension. What that is? Oh, MAP 21 is the, uh, is the Surface Transportation Reauthorization Bill. It stands for Moving America, uh, Moving America, American Progress, I think, 21, towards the 21st century. Uh, I was better with Safety Lou, which is the predecessor of that. Uh, however, uh, there has been a shift in the way that they, they look at uh, their programs and there's a lot of congestion mitigation uh, uh, grants and programs available to fund, to fund transportation alternatives such as bicycle infrastructure, pedestrian infrastructure, and so forth. So we would be looking at that kind of uh, financing. We'll see what Congress does with the next reauthorization bill and if maybe they would create a program that would, would fund sidewalks or something that would be sidewalk related. Well, so back to the ODOT money, can we still apply for that for the remaining work that needs to be done in our streetscape downtown? Not unless you want to hold the project off, and it's out to bid right now. It takes a couple of years to get that. Okay. Um, I know it might not be uh, easy to do, but if we could get some kind of assessment of like likelihood of getting future funding, I think that will help with some of the decision making. Okay. And so, you know, I don't know what's the best way to approach that, but just, you know, of these and other options, what is the potential maybe out over five years or something? So. I think we probably could work, could work, work on something like that. I don't know, Patty's a grant whiz, so. At least looking into, I mean, we've never really been talking about the Quarry Street connection, um, <coughs> Short Street, um, but those sidewalks will need work. Um, so I think in terms of ODOT, I would think that those areas would be possibilities. <coughs> um, I'm just, yeah, kind of surprised we didn't think of the, we were. What? There's I'm just, we, ba I'm babbling. Yeah, the, <laughs> okay, okay. The fact that we didn't pursue funding on oh. projects. When we started it, mm -hmm. I, yeah. Oh. Okay, cool. Sorry. Are there any more questions about that part? Okay. Uh, so, looking at the analysis of funding time frame, I looked a maximum of 30 years out, except for looking at our current situation. I kind of took that to its logical conclusion on Excel. And uh, one thing I do want to note, though, is that this, these figures do not include adding new sidewalks anywhere in the village. Just is focus on replacing the existing sidewalk infrastructure that we have. Uh, but if we would look at, wanted to look at new sidewalk inf infrastructure, we would have to determine where the village would want to have those sidewalks. Do we want to focus on these things within a five minute walk of downtown Yellow Springs, a five minute walk with, uh, from schools, the high school and the elementary school? Um, how do we handle state streets in that process? How do we look at planned unit developments? There's about five of them, three of them residential, where sidewalks may not be included <coughs> in those development plans. So we would not be able to put sidewalks in them because of a decision from the Planning Commission. And then also the equity factor, which just looking at you know the fairness uh, across the board, 
uh, for the entire village would kind of come into play. But just looking at existing repairs for existing infrastructure, we would be looking at a 96 year window for maintaining roughly about the amount of money that we put into sidewalk funding at a 2% cost of living increase. Now this number, all, these numbers all include cost of living increases for the total amounts uh, to kind of balance the increase with inflation. It also, the, it's structured in a way to, if there's recession and prices drop, we could take advantage of savings. But if there's, if there's a lot of construction activity and prices are higher, it kind of balances out over the long run. So 2% is kind of a standard average for that. If we look at a 30-year maintenance plan, which would be to the maximum recommended lifespan of a sidewalk, concrete sidewalk, we're looking at $206,000 a year for 30 years. Of the $4.8 million, we would spend an extra $6.4 million over 30 years. 10 years, we'd have to increase our funding to $483,000, but we would be saving uh, about a million dollars off the over 30-year plan. And then the five-year plan, which would be associated with the levy, uh, would be $843,000 a year, and the village would be spending about $5 million on that. A little over five <coughs> So that is kind of the funding analysis with the existing sidewalks. Uh, the second thing that we looked at in the analysis was looking at the goals of the village, and these, this was developed looking at our conference of plan, looking at the Yellow Springs and Miami Township vision documents, um, as well as looking at some of the concerns that would be protecting the village as, and also concerns from the community and so forth. So walkability, which is a big goal from both plans, uh, is rated. Accessibility, which means does this completely meet ADA uh, uh, requirements. Legal liability, looking at how does it expose the village to uh, any type of lawsuits or insurance claims. Uh, funding, feasibility, which basically means like can, is this realistic funding, is there a realistic funding structure in place for these options? And then equity, making sure that it's all, all villagers are treated fairly regarding uh, their different incomes, races, religions, et cetera. Uh, these numbers were basically scored on a scale of one to five, one being it doesn't meet it at all, five mean it means it means it completely. Um, and I basically went through and rated each of the, uh, the options uh, based on as much information as I, I, I could determine from the different options. So they were scored and then uh, I added everything up and it looks like there's, it's very close for uh, funding either the repair of sidewalks or returning the responsibility. Uh, under the three options that, that I listed. Uh, now, you know, as the discussion unfolds, some of these options could change, some of these scorings could change. Um, so there was kind of something that kind of threw out there as this is my best guess as to how close these, these options would meet those goals. Yeah. Um, could, I'd like to just say a couple things. One thing, of course, this was sub somewhat subjective, I guess, in terms of your rating. Mm -hmm. um, also, there could be some other things added, like environmental concerns. Yes. Um, the other thing is, I, I assume you weighted these equally. Yes. So, for example, if we said, well, funding is more important, mm -hmm. that so anything that we would decide would be more important mm -hmm. could skew the results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is just a generic, threw it out there as, as a, a possible metric where we could, we can Evaluate it over the over the course of the discussion and find, you know, some assign some numerical value for the values to kind of guide our policy discussions. So, if there are you know proposals to you know add more categories and discuss these things, I'm open for that. Well, yeah, I, I would like to just focus on walkability and ADA mm -hmm. compliance because I, I guess when I think about it, if the standards are coming from the village, it seems to me that fund repair and return responsibilities should be both fives. Same with ADA compliance if, if we're producing the standards. So I was wondering what, what you were thinking about as being different. Oh, those just between those two categories? Uh, mainly um, how we would be looking at uh, making sure that there's an equal spacing for the 200 foot, 5 foot 5 sections, making sure that we have uh, the, the handicap ramp accesses. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot more control under fund repair to 
basically just go through and say this is where the five by five is going to be. When you go back to the return responsibility of the property owner, it's going to be a little bit more vague because you're doing basically everything at a kind of a piecemeal, case by case basis. I have a question. Go ahead. If the responsibility were returned to the property owner, would the ADA requirement still apply because they're not a government? That's a good question. And one I do not know the answer to. Uh, maybe we can look further into that because there are some different determinations as to whether or not this is right. a sidewalk program mm -hmm. or if it's, you know, individual right. property owners to maintain their sidewalks. You know, I, I would always err on the side of ADA yeah. because that is the regulation. And, yeah, and and I would, that, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I would agree mm -hmm. that if it's, uh, you know, considered a program that we're running, then probably the ADA compliance would still oh, yeah, it, apply at that mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. And but even so, if, you know, it's better to be safe with that than to be sorry and right. end up like yeah. Los Angeles. And is that being communicated on new developments? I mean, we would, uh, we I, would have to... Mm -hmm we would have to map out where those five yeah. foot turnarounds would need to be and they yeah. would just kind of random they might fall they could right fall. on a property line so they could fall well, in front of a fire hydrant or a tree they, yeah my sidewalk is four feet so so we've got a whole new development that was built with four foot sidewalks without those ramps well, because our regulations currently don't don't well, reflect ada requirements right because here's here's what i think I think that if it were returned 100% to the property owner, it would that would not need to be ADA compliant, only because of the equity that you know or the inequity that would apply in requiring that property owner to have a five foot section and this one mm -hmm. not to. Also, but usually aren't ADA requirements kind of you know you've got an old building and it, unless you're actually making big changes to the building. If yes. you're just maintaining the building, you don't well, have to put in the ramps, et cetera. But if you are making, there's a threshold mm -hmm. of, if you're making things, then then you need to, you're making big improvements, then you have to make everything ADA compliant. But that's for government. I don't know that that even necessarily applies. No, it to applies private. to any private, like Wittenberg, if we want to remodel mm -hmm. a building and we want to, mm -hmm you know, because we've got a lot of old buildings on our mm -hmm. campus. Mm -hmm. um, if we're doing a major remodeling job, we absolutely have to make it, that building ADA compliant. But you're a business. I, right. I mean, a, a private homeowner doesn't have to make their home ADA accessible. Yeah. No. So, no. But, but, this but, is, but a business has to make, a business doing major modifications. It does sound like this is something yeah. that needs yeah. to be looked up because it is a yeah. little, it's a murky, More murky area. Legal. <clears throat> and I, I think there's kind of, you know, the, the California example, there's, uh, kind of a, a push towards more of an ADA mm -hmm. uh, regulatory, you know, complying with that. And I know a lot of cities and around the country at least are doing the, the cross the, the, the ramps. The ramps are a big mm -hmm. deal everywhere. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and, and Birch does have ramps. Mm -hmm. I mean, it does have the ADA compliant ramps in it. So we would have to at least do that if we returned it, if we did option B. Well, I want to say thanks for starting to put together this kind of evaluation scheme because this is definitely something that we can then, mm -hmm. you know, dig into. Yeah. So. so we're not done. I've got a couple more slides. Uh, I think this might be the last slide. Uh, so a couple of next steps, and we're just kind of transitioning to this. We do have some things that um, we could work on actively while the discussion is moving forward. One of them is... Uh, doing a complete inventory of the existing sidewalk conditions in the village. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're getting a new mapping software that will allow us to, to display these uh, electronically on a map uh, that's created uh, electronically. We are looking at uh, purchasing a GPS locator device, and uh, we will be able to use the GPS locator to pinpoint the exact coordinates of damaged sidewalks in the village. So we can have someone go around and say, okay, this panel's bad, plug up the coordinates, put it in an Excel sh spreadsheet, fire it off to the map, and there it is on the map. Hmm. And uh, this is something that I did in Bellevue with our tree inventory where uh, we had someone go around and inventory all the trees using a GPS locator. And now we have an active and updated analysis of that. So, you know, I am uh, getting an intern this summer that could be devoted towards this type of project if we have everything in place. So that could be an option for us uh, over the next couple of months to actively go out and do that. The second thing that we would need to do would be to uh, update our um, 
our standards for sidewalk construction to comply with ADA and also recommended practices. So that's something that we can easily do with uh, an ordinance uh, of council. I would probably recommend taking it to the Planning Commission first, mm -hmm. since it does concern them as well. Uh, but that's something that we can bring uh, we can bring up relatively easily without having to address the whole ownership responsibility and maintenance discussion. Mm -hmm. And then finally, just uh, we'll have a conversation about determining which path forward is the best path forward for the village and doing some more exploration as to finding out, fleshing out those options. So I look to you, uh, you guys for guidance on which option we should uh, look more into. And uh, if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. That's it. That's it. Yes. So, wow. Can, now we can have a discussion and involve staff as we. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that's really a very good report. Thank you. And thank you. I thank you. It's a, and I think I like this model of doing anything that is likely to be controversial, of starting with just something very neutrally laying out mm -hmm. as much detail as you can get by a certain time, so I really appreciate staffs um, working this, this process and uh, want to thank you for that. I'd like to make sure that everyone knows that not only did John do an excellent job on this, but Jason is also involved in uh, helping. No, Jason's putting his hands off of it. <laughs> <laughs> We started with your basic document, I believe. I would, yes. Yeah, yes. I was going to say you laid out a lot about you know what would happen if we did return responsibility, you know, several mm -hmm. months ago. So, okay. I, I have a question. You know, you, you, <clears throat> we talked about streetscape and, and other, mm -hmm. but but there is some villa zone property that has sidewalks mm -hmm. presently on it that are in need of repair, and what are Either way we go, we have to fix those. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just want to mention one more one more question that I have um, before we open up the discussion. Um, so it, it's related to the insurance, and I think mm -hmm. I sent this to an email, but I just like to understand uh, what kind of costs we're looking at related to liability insurance, and also what the trends have been, because I know you referred in your report to just kind of that being out there, um, and that does relate to moving away from the status quo. I think Chris was working on that. Okay. So I, I don't think we need it today, but unless you have it. Well, I, I don't have it, the, the specifics, because I mean, we don't, it, it, it's hard to anticipate what projected the premium increases would be based upon claims. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's, probably some projections and come up with some sense, but I don't think we act with it to a great degree. Mm -hmm. I, I think I, I, I put it this way. Right now as a concept, I can make a couple phone calls and try to get some more detail on it. Or at least historical data about what's happened over the, if we've got it. Is that? I, I don't know because the, because the village would have its own claims experience. And um, to my knowledge, in the, the three years I've been solicitor, uh, there's only been one claim made based upon a, a sidewalk issue. Uh, there's been more than that. See, I don't even know what the claims history that is. Yeah. I, I know that there have been at least two since I've been here. Um, and the, the one that we have pending was prior to my time, so. That, and that's the only one that I'm aware of. We, I, I checked with the chief, uh, Chief Hale on this, about incidents concerning mm -hmm. sidewalks and, and vehicle accidents and there you know there are at least there are at least two in the last five years that have happened I have one report on my desk well Ruth Ann would know about the folks that um, say they've like been injured on a sidewalk um, because she handles that paperwork with the insurance company okay so. are there any more questions for me well, I'm sure they're right <laughs> <now. laughs> um, well yeah I have a question sure um, you did, in, in the report that you gave us, you listed some different materials. Oh, yeah, the resources? Mm -hmm. Materials for, for the oh. sidewalks. 
Okay. Rubber beam. Construction materials. Oh, construction, construction materials. Material. Yeah. Not, yeah. not yeah. reference yeah. materials. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> construction materials. I'm really excited about the reference materials, actually. Yes. <laughs> they, they are uh, good. There are a lot of reference materials. <laughs> but yes, construction I, I'm materials. I'm more interested in the construction materials. So, um, clearly, uh, of everything you listed, what mm -hmm. were the just regular con cement sidewalk, concrete mm -hmm. sidewalks are the cheapest? I, well, preface this, given that I think we're probably going to be looking at, at some point in the near future, having to cut a couple hundred thousand dollars from our budget, three hundred thousand dollars. Thinking about spending more on sidewalks is, has to fit in with that somewhere. So there are cheaper ways of having paths, say. Uh, and I, I brought up the issue of like crushed limestone at one point because I rode my bike for 100 miles on the mm -hmm. towpath between uh, Canal Fulton, I guess, and Cleveland. It was great. People were walking on it. I was riding my bike on it, no problem. Um, but there are other ways that you can, other materials that are, yes, they're not as per permanent, but they're certainly cheaper. So my, and in, but more environmentally mm -hmm. friendly. Have you run into anything that's more sort of ecologically friendly, like stone or the, chip, wood chips? Yeah, or? the permeable pavement option, there's actually two yeah. different ones. There's permeable pavement, there's also permeable asphalt. But permeable pavement is usually, permeable concrete is normally what's used for sidewalks in the ecological balance. They are more porous, so there's basically like, it's basically harder gravel, but it's hard enough that it is ADA compliant. So, and it does allow water to, pour, to go through, which does, does kind of address the ecological concerns. Mm -hmm. um, it's more expensive. Though. It's a yeah. little bit more expensive. It's uh, surprisingly. Uh, are yeah. but not are these much. the only um, materials that are allowed to be well, ADA mm -hmm. compliant or there's asphalt could be? Asphalt uh, was the other one and I did not look at that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, in this, in this but what about, I mean, I know um, like crushed limestone, I lived on a gravel road my whole life and um, when I was growing up. And I know that when it's first laid, it's pretty bumpy. It takes use for it to smooth out. Mm -hmm. So I would assume it or wood chips or anything like that would not be ADA compliant. No, I mean, I, I could double check with crushed limestone, but everything I found kind of pointing to, down that route said it wasn't ADA. Mm -hmm. so. And, and it can't be cleared. I mean, it can't be, snow can't be right. removed from it. So, mm -hmm. I mean, like the path you were mentioning, Marianne, I'm, I'm assuming that that's a voluntary path. It's, 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 people don't have to use that path to get to work or to get to school. Well, th there is a It's village. recreational, so it's I, not I have been to a transportation. where my brother lives, where the whole downtown was, wasn't cement, it was fresh limestone or something like that. What's the place? And this is in New Hampshire, uh -huh. so, uh, you know, I don't Well, maybe you could give John the yeah, name I'll, of that I'll, place. I will that would be him cool. Yeah, we'll look into yeah, it. I would think fresh limestone, once it's wet, if you roll it. Jason, what do you think? We're still going to have heavy rainfall and everything. Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, we can, work a lot we like can investigate, gravel, Marianne. Yeah. <coughs> it's the, the, the maintenance, the, the weed, the weed maintenance is not easy. They're about the only way to do it is with chemicals. <laughs> Diane's laughing. I mean, I've got, I've, that's what my parking, my, or my, what my driveway is, and it's, mm -hmm. I can't imagine that is a, as a, as a permanent walk. walking surface. The only downfall about asphalt though is the breakdown, the deterioration is so fast that you're constantly sitting in the mud. Mm -hmm. You're going to do a one hit fix. Concrete is probably the best way to go and then the permanent paper is going to be Asphalt will do it, but you're going to be fixing it. I'm shocked at the permeable pavers though. That's, I'm shocked that those it's are pretty reasonable. Right. Considering it's not that much yeah. more expensive. Mm -hmm. And I can probably get some more defined bids for the different types of permeable services that, that mm -hmm. they offer. Or are there grants offer. out if you are also thinking about them more? Yeah, you know, we could probably look to see if there are some ecological or environmental right. associated grants with that that we can piggyback on. So, 
We can look into it. Jason, where your was your well, hand I was going? I just want to touch on Marion's point earlier about mm. the three foot minimum. Yeah. That, that is the minimum, but what John has pointed out, what I had him point out, is, is as we discussed last time, uh, per Karen, um, when you touch anything that's less than five foot, the um, Federal Highway Administration really suggests that you go five foot to make everything uniform, and that only that complies with ADA regs. If you have a person in a wheelchair, you still have two-way um, transportation or walkability. Mm -hmm. And that's why you don't want to narrow yourself in there. And that's why they say five foot is really the minimum that they suggest. Well, I guess I'm, I'm mostly thinking of finances. Yes. But if mm -hmm. we're going to put a sidewalk somewhere where we think it's important <laughs> to have a sidewalk, but at the same time, we also realize there's not a, probably going to be a lot of traffic. That might be <coughs> an option. I mean, I think we're going to have if we mm -hmm. we're going to have to look at all all the options we have. And right. I I guess I would like I really would like citizens to get involved in this. I know we have a cyclist here, and and Helen Iyer had talked uh, earlier about her concern about downtown and not being able to get through the sidewalks in the winter because of the snow getting piled up on the edges. So there are different issues. But there are some places, I think, where the existing streets can serve for walking, biking, and driving. And maybe there's some kind of signage we can use. So when we're thinking about, uh, I guess, the master plan, I'd really like to have staff and, and citizens get involved in looking at where do we have streets that exist that can serve as walking, biking, and driving, and wheelchair. For example, Livermore, well, there are some sidewalks on Livermore, but a lot of Livermore doesn't, and it seems to work okay. And the college is putting in a bunch of new sidewalks. Yeah, they are, and that, that's a good thing. <laughs> Fair Acres, I think, is a good example. So, I, I mean, we. The reason why, the reason why uh, LA and Austin haven't done their plans is because they don't have money to do it, and we're going to be running into the same thing too. Well, I mean, we already so, are. So, and we have been. I mean, that's why we haven't been doing it. So, I mean, I think we really need to be strategic about this. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. The does the Safe Routes to School plan go back to some of that? Um, does it have more of a needs kind of analysis of? Um, not just existing conditions, but let's say, I, I think Spillan is a good example of a heavily traveled street with no road, with no sidewalks, that probably, with a lot of kids, that probably should have. Now, does, you know, do, this, do the secondary streets, does Meadow, does Orton, do those need sidewalks? Probably not. I mean, those are just ones, I think at some point, we're just going to have to say, this kind of street, as Marianne mm -hmm. said, just is not going to get sidewalks because we're never going to get to it. We're never going to get, mm -hmm. you but know, if we're talking mm -hmm. $5 million just with what we have. And I think that there might be ways that we can have signage or whether it's bump outs or whatever, and you'd be good at yeah. figuring well, out and this, and Dan might have, I mean, mm -hmm. different people are going to have ideas of how to well, and of maybe bring treat it towards the more of a street treat. streets mm -hmm. policy. And yeah. maybe work yeah. with residents and probably to one of the most the problematic streets. I agree. Spillan mm -hmm. is one that it would be really nice if there was a sidewalk on at least one, one side, side of that street. Mm -hmm. um, Limestone is another one. It's pretty heavily trafficked and mm -hmm. lots of kids. And mm -hmm. but the tricky part is that it is narrow. It's narrow with narrow frontages. Mm -hmm. So even just <coughs> fitting a sidewalk in there in some mm -hmm. places, I think, would be difficult. But it, it is another street that. If, if I remember correctly, and I, and I could be wrong about this, but the sidewalk on Limestone was proposed to go mm -hmm. on the, what is that, the, the north side of the road? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was, that was proposed for Safe Routes to School, right. but they just, mm -hmm. that, yeah, that Fairfield section yeah. just Safe got Routes has a lot of out. proposals that it just, they did not have enough money to fund it, so that's mm -hmm. why it kind of got yeah. staggered back. So, you know, one of the options right. that they could do is in future Safe Routes, proposals say like we started here we want to finish it to going down some other direction from the mm -hmm. elementary school right and I, yeah. I did talk right. to uh, Tommy that. Arnold about that and mm -hmm. he said it would just require minimal updates to the plan and just to say you know essentially nothing has changed and 
uh, you know, maybe update the figures with the numbers of kids or something, but the plan itself that they worked on um, would still be acceptable. Cool. Okay. You know, the other thing is, you know, we're becoming an aging community. And, and, and I had the unfortunate experience of trying to get my, my wife around uh, just the small area that, that we live in. Uh, and with an aging community, more and more people may be uh, their ability, <clears throat> ability to get around maybe with a wheelchair. And uh, to me, it kind of le leaves with a couple of, well, it leaves them with a couple of options mm -hmm. is they can't get around. They either try to move to an area mm -hmm. that they can or they leave the community. And uh, so, you know, uh, it, and, and I'm thinking in terms of the main thoroughfare is from Xenia Avenue up to the high school. Mm -hmm. You know, um, at least there are quite a few soon to be seniors living in in that area. Um, so you, you know, I, maybe I, I, from Friends Care to the high school, or really. you know, right? So you know, and, uh, you know, the, there is a cost associated with everything, but again, we, we we still have to kind of face that that reality of the fact that we're we're, we're becoming older and and our needs are. Are going to change. I know we, we we put a lot into the kids being able to get around Mills Lawn, but not a lot on the high school kids being able to get back and forth on, mm -hmm. on, on the high school. And even with the sidewalks are there as they are now, they can walk single file, or you know if they try to walk two abreast, someone's in the grass or someone's on the side. So it's just something that you know. You touched on a big point with the uh, with the uh, kind of this movement is called aging in place, and a lot of people who are retiring into the retirement age want to stay in the communities that they that they've been in for for their where they raise their families, but the problem has been making it accessible. So the AARP Urban Land Institute and APA did a, a, a big study last year where they looked at what are the preferences for new retirees. And the big thing was reducing auto dependency and having more walkable and bicycle infrastructure. Because they felt that as you age, you don't want to be driving everywhere. You did that for the last you know, three or four decades raising your family. Now, you want, now most retirees want to be able to walk to places, want to have a, a safe connection walking across the street. Uh, so there are support for traffic calming because that helps increase activity for people who may not want to use automobiles in the future, but still want to be in the community that they live in right now. So that's something to consider. I mean, it's, it seems like we've got a lot of, so we've given John a lot to research issues on, um, I think some of the funding options and, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I mean, and, and the idea, I still think we do, we do have a lot of exist, a lot of questions about some of the, the existing conditions. So his idea that, that his, intern this summer work on um, pulling that together seems like a good one is that mm -hmm. I, I would like a way for citizens to be involved okay. I think um, mm -hmm. well we have citizens who are cyclists or like Jerry says older older people people who have disabilities and also people who live in neighborhoods who can say this seems to be a dangerous area or this is a safe area, so. I, I, I agree. I, one of the things I was kind of tossing out when I was developing this report was having some, some kind of, I guess, a sidewalk uh, discussion, like a workshop of sorts that, you know, we could kind of identify, and I guess this would be the start of it since this is a public, uh, you know, discussion that we're having right now. But something a bit more formal, we can have maps of the village and show where the problem points are, mm -hmm. and uh, kind of explore ideas and ways to kind of uh, look at policy alternatives on a more uh, inclusionary and uh, public level. And oh, we did that with with Eric Swanson actually. Okay. So that would have been boy, 2007, 2000. It was before I was on council, and and it was it was a very well attended. I mean, he had we had big maps, we had big we had big condition posters. You may have found some of that information, Sorry, yeah. mm -hmm. and it was very much for this for this exact purpose. 
um, what we got off track on then was deciding that every street, the discussion was every street had to have a sidewalk on both sides. That shut down the discussion. I mean, it was so impossible. It was this equity thing, and it was su such an impossible thing to consider that it essentially shut down the discussion. So I feel like we're on a much better and more realistic track, at least. It also occurs to me that we have a group in place to collaborate with on this, which is the bike committee, safe routes mm -hmm. to school. Um, so, you know, it seems that working with that group that's already done a lot of work in this area uh, to have this forum or discussion to do your first step, which I think is what are our standards, um, makes sense. And it definitely will be engaged in, as part of the process. I mean, that's definitely a huge asset that we have, having that subcommittee uh, in the village. Mm -hmm. so. I'd like to see some of the materials develop more before we have a public I mean, I'd like the maps. I'd like clearer maps. When are you talking about having the GIS capabilities? Well, we're in the process of getting the machines that would be able to run GIS, so we can get the order for GIS, and it's relatively simple. It's software, so uh, it's just probably the next couple of months. I would certainly <laughs> hope so. Um, and then uh, I know one of our departments is looking at doing a GPS location. Uh, having one of those devices so we would be able to kind of utilize that if we can, when we can and then uh, the intern will be starting in July and working through uh, the end of August beginning of September so that would give enough time to be out there with the device and doing all the surveying for the sidewalks um, and now is the time when people let a lot of growth occur over the sidewalks and so we need to do every year we need to mm -hmm. send out some kind of message and yeah. try to get it posted that people need to cut back their trees cut back the yeah. stuff that's growing over the sidewalks yeah jason normally um takes care of sending uh, those contacts out and, and asking folks to cut things back okay great do we want to talk at all about whether we want to return responsibility wholly or in part to the property owners, or do we want to or keep it within the village, or do we want that to be another time? I thought we were going to investigate grant funding first to see what might be available to help. I mean, that's, that's what I wrote down. I mean, and I think, I thought we had some questions for, for John related to, was it, was it Dallas's program? I thought that there yeah, were still right. some yeah. questions. I mean, I'd like to get more of that information. I, I'm certainly, I, I am thinking this is going to be some kind of a partnership. That's, mm -hmm. whether it be, whether it be a levy, whether it be, you know, something similar to what Dallas is doing. I, I don't see us just whole hog putting it back. Um, to on the property owners. On property owners. I, but I don't see us being able to fund everything. Right. I think so, it's got to be, there's got to be some level of There could be a hybrid where we look at section 660 where the sidewalk regulation is and say, we're going to throw it all out and put in new regulations where we do implement some of that. So right. that could be an option as well. Um, I guess I'd just like to say, it, I, I do not support giving it all back to property owners. But regardless of what we do however much we do someone is going to pay for it yep and if the village pays for part of it and property owners pay for part of it how much different is that than the village is paying for all of it because the property owners are the village it just means that those people who are unlucky enough to have a sidewalk on their property have to pay a bit more of it but but Marianne, we don't have the money. The money doesn't exist. Well, I mean, we, we would, would have, have to, to get, have a yeah, levy have to, to get it, the money. Right, right. So we have to make we would have to make the case for that. Yeah, but I mean, it's us that's going to be paying for it in the end. Mm -hmm. Right. That's I, true. Clearly, yeah. yeah. There are a couple things I want to throw out there, and and I understand this is going to take some time. But two things that rise to the top that I think are short term. One is the fee in lieu. And I know you highlighted at the end, you know, how soon could maybe planning commission explore that and just see if that makes sense. Because, I mean, if we have new developments going in, even if we haven't developed our standards, if we have that, we can start to build a pot of money. The other thing is the fast fix. It occurred to me that um, 
how, I wonder how long we have to, or how much work we have to do before we just try to do something voluntary. Um, because, you know, I run into people all the time that are fixing their patches. And I know it'd be great to establish, okay, we're going to make everything ADA compliant. But if people are just matching up their sidewalks, could the village in the short term facilitate that voluntary approach by, um, you know, like Dallas is doing with fast fix, contracting, getting the best price, and helping out folks that are trying to fix it now. So we can explore that. Yeah. So maybe those are things that can happen before we have the master plan, but I don't know. Okay. Any other discussion, citizens? I should have said that people could just jump Can't right in, right. but um, Dan. Just stay down there. Might as well just stay down there. Dan Kerrigan, citizen. Um, so, thank you very much for your report. I really want you, I hope, encourage you or your management or the, the council to do a good GIS study of the sidewalks. I still disagree that there's 17 miles of sidewalks in the village. I think it's much less because I learned that from Safe Routes to School but I'd rather see it trust but verify. So, but in any case, um, the proposal to, to basically do the whole village ADA compliant doesn't fly with me. Can you talk and to the reason, us? And the reason why is, well, I'm Then maybe John, dialogue. why don't you come yeah. up, come but up any the case, table. The reason why is ADA um, is where you require employers to make accommodations for the employees and to provide public access, or impose accessibility access for public accommodations. So, Mr. Sims, is your house a public accommodation? I don't think you're operating a hotel. What, wasn't talking about my house. No, no, but but you <laughs> I'm know talking that's about the, talking about the sidewalk. Yeah, but that's for public accommodations. So, for example, yeah, on Walnut Street, is, yeah. the sidewalk in front of the house and into the house, into the, the structure. But that's public accommodations. For people who live in, on uh, Omar Circle, Fair Acres, those are all what are called estate Thanks. lots. Yeah. I don't think there is such a thing. Oh, she's gone. Yeah. I don't, John, I don't believe, Mr. Young, I don't believe there is such a thing as estate streets. They're in planning, there's estate lots. And I remember seeing it in Greene County's uh, zoning regulations. And that's when the developer who did Omar Circle, Fair Acres, whatever, they said, hey, we're putting these houses in. We've got to build them real quick. And we, there's, they're basically cul-de-sacs. There's no through traffic on Fair Acres, right. Omar, et cetera, et cetera. You don't need a sidewalk. And the village or the Greene County zoning and the village said, no, we're not going to put sidewalks in. No. There are streets when people have put the houses in, and then they say, you know what? We got a lot of kids here. Let's put a sidewalk down uh, Allen Street. And they approach the village. The village says, yeah, that's a good idea. We're going to do it, and we're going to do an assessment on both sides of the uh, Allen Street. So to me, you know, property is your responsibility. I mean, I, I just, I, to me, I, I, you know, it has its duties as well as its rights. So to me, it's my responsibility if I bought a property that has sidewalk. When I, I, I didn't own, but I lived on uh, Whiteman Street near Antioch College. You had to have a sidewalk because you had lots of students and things going on. But where I live now in Fair Acres, we have the best sidewalks around. They're <laughs> called paved roads. Thank you very much all last year for paving the roads. It's one of the finest walking streets and I believe most of the streets in village are walking streets anyway especially in the winter time when all the snow is on all the streets that do have sidewalks you still walk in the middle of the street I haven't seen any great increase in almost coming to this village for over 40 years I've never seen any danger of not using a sidewalk and that includes my grandson coming he's only nine years old and when he start coming here at six years old so I just don't buy the we have to have sidewalks everywhere on every street. It just doesn't fly in terms of common sense. And also, it doesn't look like it's very affordable. So um, 
Um, and one of the biggest things that's missing from the report I, that I don't see, and that was the big hang up last time, is there is no established criteria for when a sidewalk needs to be repaired. And so on Allen Street, when a sidewalk was damaged by a lot of construction traffic, uh, I heard a neighbor say, hey, aren't you going to fix that now that the village is repairing sidewalks? And nothing got done. Because I don't believe in the code, there's an establishment that says if there's more than half an inch or two inch you know, separation, you know, you can Google all this stuff on the internet and find, you know, like what, what do they do in Portland if you want to be bikey happy and all that. I think I've gone over my three minutes. I don't want to go anymore. No, no time. No, 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 no. But, um, well, I, I have a question. Sure. Um, you, I, I think you were saying that you think that a lot of streets in Yellow Springs are safe for walking and biking and wheelchairs. So, yes. Right. So are, do you feel that it, um, it, Wait a minute. I feel safe because I understand what, how you walk on a street. I understand the rules of the road. If Chief Hale would make a little more effort, I, and I asked Chief Hale since she came in, there's a lot of people in this village that need to have a little understanding of the rules of the road. That is, you walk facing traffic. I've seen more people walk with traffic on the, and you know, the rules are, if there's a sidewalk, use it. If it's usable. If not, then you use the berm or the shoulder. If not usable, then you use the sidewalk, the road. The road is, you know, the street, it's a public conveyance. It's yours, it's ours. So are you also saying that you think that there are some streets that make sense to have sidewalks of course. and others that don't? The, the ones that have public accommodations. <laughs> and they're already there mm -hmm. for the most part. They could be better. Um, you know, I can only think recently on Allen Street where all the houses were built between um, Spillane and President Street when all those houses were built on the east side. Mm -hmm. You know, they went in later and decided to put the sidewalk in. The village agreed and they, they did it. So, any questions? Paul had a question. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Can I just make a clarification that our subdivision regulations do have a street section for state streets where it calls for the different parameters for constructing an estate street in a diagram. In fact, if council remembers the discussion about the sidewalks on Mercer Court mm -hmm. uh, way back at the What was that section? It, it's right after section 12. Um, when the, 26. The, the citizens were polled as to whether they wanted sidewalks or trees. Right. And I actually went to Tamara to say, if the sidewalks are taken out, do they have to be put back? And there was this whole discussion about the state streets versus regular streets, and it would have to be rezoned if you didn't want the sidewalks back. And okay. So, Paul. Again, Paul Abendroth. I've got a lot of ideas about sidewalks, and I hope you have other working sessions where we can discuss this. It's going on your uh, 9 o'clock uh, suggested end of the meeting, and, and so on. First, I'd like to address something that Mary Ann addressed. Uh, I'll repeat my favorite uh, pogo expression from the car cartoon. We have met the enemy, and they is us. Uh, I noticed in the little summary, and that was a, you know, John's summary of pros and cons, it was useful to have something like that. The largest difference between the, the choices was in cost. And the highest score for cost was given to put it on the landlord or on the property owner. They is us. It's going to cost just as much to do it for the citizens if they do it out of pocket as if the village does it for them. You can't show a varying uh, value of cost to the village as a whole like, like that. Same. So con consider that you're, you know, 
that it's going to cost the citizens one way or the other. I think just like we have three classifications of streets, we have through streets and residential streets and, and so on, which can use some work in, in defining and using those terms, we should have the same for sidewalks. And it would be almost the same, but it wouldn't be the same because, you know, say fruits of school, some residential streets are very important for pedestrians. So I think every street should be looked at carefully and graded. Do you want one sidewalk, two sidewalks, no sidewalks? Do you want to add sidewalks where there's none? Do you want to abandon sidewalks where they're not necessary? Have an overall plan so that any decisions on we're going to do that this year or make this done this year will be based upon that overall plan and not have one rule applies to everybody because that isn't appropriate to have the same emphasis on a residential street and a, on a cul-de-sac as a, a block from downtown. Mm -hmm. That's what I have today. I hope we have some more sessions. For instance, many of the problems with sidewalks, one panel is slightly tipped. Right off the edge, it's good for another 20 years. 10 minutes, and that panel doesn't have to be dug up and re-poured and, and, and so on. Yeah, I believe that Jason, well, raising yeah, them yeah, up. Jason and, so and his crew there, have been doing that. various things that, that which can be done inexpensively to improve the situation that don't uh, require overall. Mm -hmm. And one thing in favor of the village, oh, the development plan for the country has been take a block of farmland, a developer puts in all of the streets, sewers, water lines, sidewalks, curbs, and turns it over to the village. And I look at maintaining the sidewalk like maintaining the water pipe. Do you charge the person that the water pipe is in front of their house for replacing the water pipe? It's for the village. I would like to see a real number on the value of a sidewalk in front of a house for the property value. I don't think it's $100, personally, in, in the property value. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a community asset, not a individual landowner's asset. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Dan? Uh, oh, hi, Dan Reyes. Um, getting too close too far, getting used to the new <laughs> mic still. And uh, there are a couple of interesting things uh, in the discussion tonight. So I, I appreciate the report and you folks um, setting the, aside the time for this discussion. Um, generally, and I think I've remarked on this before, that I, I've had the impression that sidewalks are largely an underappreciated part of public infrastructure until we find out that it's either not there, it's fallen apart, or uh, that we need it. Uh, I wish that somebody had taken care of it. So I'm, I, I'm glad that it's on the agenda. I, I think, you know, the thing that's called the status quo for us right now is the peculiar solution to a previous status quo, which was how we got into this mess in the first place. The uh, basically no maintenance plan that existed for decades before in the village. And uh, a previous council got together and tried to solve that with the first effort, which was the 50 or $60,000 set aside. Uh, for maintenance, which has proven, it seems, problematic so far. But it, I, I think it's addressing, nonetheless, a, an appropriate problem to, or an appropriate challenge to, for the village to take seriously. Uh, I, I was, um, w with things that were brought up tonight, uh, a couple of, of uh, items stood out to me. One that was I was enthusiastic about and, and interested in, Maybe I've missed it before, but uh, the, the notion of pursuing some other public funding for some streetscape projects seems to me to make a great deal of sense, particularly if we use our definition of, if we consider our definition of streetscape a little bit more broadly. And I mean, streetscape can be, uh, I suppose the majority of them are public commercial spaces or some combination of those. Uh, but it can also be the interconnectivity between major spaces in a community. I think you can make a case for that. And we do have some places where we could, we could talk about major avenues connecting major public spaces as appropriate 
objects of streetscape. That, that's just a, you know, a line of, of thinking that's worth at least asking about. Um, the other thing that I wonder about, and I guess we're waiting still for uh, more detail, is, is the, you know, the actual conditions of the uh, infrastructure that we have, which is mixed. Uh, both in terms of design and in terms of condition. Um, I, I think uh, we'll, we'll probably find that there's some percentage, some amount of our sidewalks that have been done or attended to conscientiously in the last five to 10 years that are in decent shape and some that are in probably surprisingly bad shape, but we need to be able to sort those out. Um, probably also prioritize which aspects, which you know thoroughfares, whether we can find streetscape project funding or not, which sidewalks are important to the, the sort of uh, effective life of the community or, or the, you know, the community members being able to move uh, uh, about safely on highly trafficked streets. Uh, so anyway, I, I think it's all a, a good start to this and I, I hope uh, there'll be some more discussions and we'll get to look at, uh, at some of the, the details with the options. Uh, but I, I, I would perhaps most stress, you know, um, and maybe we've already, maybe that's already been uh, on the table and it's been voiced, uh, some, some similar opinions have been voiced about this, that we don't go fall back into a uh, don't worry about it until it dissolves type of uh, uh, approach to the public infrastructure. Uh, I, I, I guess the, uh, Patty, I think you'd pointed out at a, earlier meeting that the politics and me mechanics of funding for sidewalks is different from streets, but uh, philosophically, I, I think it's a similar sort of commitment for, for the community. If, if we want to be taken seriously as a pedestrian <coughs> community, one that cares about its public fabric, we have to find some appropriate way to attend to this. And, you know, if we left every street to every resident who was adjacent to it, uh, we'd probably have a mess, and, and similarly with uh, the sidewalk yeah. situation. Yeah. The mechanics for the funders for are, the funders. A, are <laughs> a little bit different, yeah than, yeah, than what we would hope them to be, but. Right. It's a well, national problem, yeah. yes. in other words, not, yeah. that we're struggling to deal with locally because there's simply not enough national investment in That's any cool. level of infrastructure, and there's nothing practically for sidewalks. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, I did have one Stray question, and it's it could wait, but I'll maybe ask while I'm here because John, you brought this up today indirectly about an intern uh, coming in. But I, I wonder, does the um, Ohio Department of Transportation produce or provide any study or support for study of these things as well? I know they have a flock of interns in the summer as well, civil engineer, aspiring civil engineers who can be put on assignment uh, with a hammer and a tape measure. And, uh, yeah, going but, about but they put them on ODOT projects yeah. Yeah, yeah. as opposed to loaning them out yeah, to or us. If there's any cooperation yeah. with that, yeah. but that's anyway. Thanks, thanks Dan. Thank, Thank you. you. So I think we're one, one short, two okay. short things, and the other Dan. So I'm looking at this Yellow Springs sidewalk conditions rating. I vaguely remember there was an Antioch uh, co-op was involved with this. Mm -hmm. And as I remember, the Safe Routes to School engineer looked at it and said, well, the problem was, what was his criteria to rate something 42 versus 71 versus 85? And that, again, goes back to the whole question of, is this, you know, on whatever, we'll take the scale of five, great or marginal, or needs to be repaired. But if you don't have a standard for what needs to be repaired, you got problems. So, and then the second thing, so Los Angeles, it does have a big problem with replacing sidewalks. Um, actually, Don, Donald Shoup, he's a professor of planning at University of UCLA, he had a very interesting proposal about five years ago. When a property owner sells the house, there has to be a certificate that says, your sidewalk's in good condition. Yeah. That's actually something Jason recommended in his report last yeah. fall. And we have you, the documentation from I that. I knew so. Professor Hamby of the road would know. <laughs> but anyway, it, it, he estimated, like you gave the estimate, it'd take 96 years to replace them. He estimated in Los Angeles it takes 69 years. But if you use the property changeover as that point where, okay, it's good to go, you could get all the sidewalks repaired in 12 years. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Not Dan. Thank you. So uh, we're clearly going to be taking this up again. Let's we'll maybe talk about it in agenda planning. Um, 
manager's reports, do we have anything um, to talk about? Nope, you have my written report unless anybody has any questions. Can um, you just mention about the trees? Uh, oh, downtown. Um, the trees. Um, we've had several questions lately about the the trees uh, from last fall's streetscape. Um, Jason has been going a little bit back and forth with the tree committee and Nate Torps because what we originally wanted became not available, but they are ordered and you hope them to be in the ground by? They'll be delivered either tomorrow or Wednesday. And they will have gator bags on them, I assume, to keep them watered. So that could be as that is one of the concerns with planting this late in May. So, um, and we will work in conjunction with the tree committee to make sure they're planted properly, watered properly, and properly. Ready to go. Um, the only other thing is, uh, I will be, um, I will be here for charter review tomorrow, but I'm gonna not be here for most of the day. I am gonna go see my dad. Um, John is taking the ICMA fellows to Cincinnati, so Chief Hale will have the village con tomorrow. <laughs> Don't <laughs> leave. He's, look, he's acting like he didn't know that, but he did. So. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, moving on to standing reports. Lori? Um, I did not go to either of my committees again, so uh, Jerry did the planning commission uh, this past uh, week in Houston okay. County. <laughs> Planning, uh, if, correct me if I'm wrong, John, but uh, the, uh, the last application from the college on the last street to, ba to be Herman. vacated, mm -hmm. Herman, is, is uh, Continued once again. continuing. <laughs> okay. oh, wow, you're kidding me. Uh, basically, just yeah. to summarize, I guess, we had uh, Jason, Hamby, and myself, and Representative from Ant Reggie Stratton from Antioch met uh, on site and reached an agreement, and we thought everything was copacetic. And then when uh, when the meeting happened, uh, they decided they wanted that uh, some other issues. So the planning commission decided to table it for next month and bring back our uh, street superintendent to iron it all out at the meeting. So in, in other words, they uh, it won't be at the next meeting. It, it won't. Yeah, yeah it won't be at the next meeting. They, they decided that the agreement that they agreed upon wasn't any good anymore. Mm -hmm. so who dis who is the they that uh, the college? The, the college, oh, the came, college rejected the college came the and said, okay. mm, I know we agree, but we don't want to agree now. And of course, our folks weren't here be other than John because we had an agreement. Right. <laughs> right. You right. Me? So, so, so we're right. kind of back to square one. And, and it seemed like they didn't have this departmental communication was kind of. Yeah, Mis okay. misconnections there. But okay. the other street vacation, which reminds me, the North College one, yeah. we're getting a description on that. Right. So that should be coming to June, maybe the maybe next meeting after that. So, yeah. okay. Moving forward. Um, and I did attend the uh, Green County Regional Planning, and it was a very strong, unanimous decision that um, from the board members with uh, Tom um, Kugler, County Commissioner Tom Kugler, abstaining. Um, that we would maintain the current structure of regional planning, that it will be, it, it, it's appearing as if Ken will, will perhaps stay on in, in a permanent way. Um, they actually have some pretty exciting things to talk about related to more planning issues as opposed to just doing, doing plat reviews and subdivision reviews. So I'm actually very excited about the potential direction maybe some increase in fees, although I'm working on getting them. I mean, we, ours can't be that much lower, but I'm actually getting, trying to talk them into trying to get more of the municipalities back in by lowering the fees for the municipalities because we're not actually using their services. It's, it's basically about communication and planning. So that's all good news. Um, Jerry? Um, CR nothing to report they did still haven't invited us back and well but they that. also didn't have they a meeting they, they, they couldn't meeting get a meeting either. together they couldn't get a meeting uh the uh mediation which uh they're planning their next update in, in june uh, library we meet next month so. okay um the charter review committee uh remains on track so we have our 
last sort of official meeting tomorrow where we look at the report that's going to come to council and uh, uh, vote on that. Um, so we're still planning on the presentation on June 1st uh, to cover that material. Um, I think it's been a great process. Uh, Public Art Commission, uh, I did want to mention that the uh, Village Innovation and Design Award, uh, the commission has made a decision on the first winner and we've decided to officially announce that at um, uh, uh, Art Stroll, which is going to be on June 19th, always the Friday after Street Fair. Um, so stay tuned for that. We'll have some more information. We're kind of, we've got John Hudson has created a really cool traveling trophy um, that's going to go pass from winter to winter. Uh, we've got certificates, a great logo, so that's pretty exciting. Um, and uh, I just heard from Jason that the final concrete pour on the phase one improvements of the skate park happened today. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a walkthrough on Wednesday at 830 and uh, or maybe it's eight. It's at 830. 830. Okay. And um, and again, we're doing the launch on June 13th during Street Fair. Very exciting, really cool work. Um, and yeah, I see kids out there sort of salivating every day. Um, community access panel. Uh, one of the things that we talked about at our last meeting is the report out on the fiber forum. Um, so when we get to agenda planning, uh, they would be prepared on June 1st for a short report if we're ready for that. Um, we're digging into the dig once policy so john has been working with village staff and community access panel on that and uh i think you saw the station manager report from susan in the packet. uh I, I think it's really exciting to see that sort of analysis of the position and and um how we maintain what we have and uh and that's what susan's focus uh, focused on so thanks again Okay, uh, Mary Ann. Okay, um, the Energy Board uh, hosted Carl Andre from Efficiency Smart, mm -hmm. and uh, the whole meeting was essentially focused on uh, discussion with him. Um, Jerry um, Papania gave a good summary of the background of what's happened through Efficiency Smart, and then, well, so those of us who had paper copies got got something that Carl had um, developed regarding uh, Efficiency Smart's impact uh, presently. Um, but a lot of the discussion was about what more can, how more can Efficiency Smart really work with the village? And that they're basically very limited to giving rebates on appliances and lighting. I mean, they're, you know, there was a confusion by some of the people attending, like, could they help with, like, uh, insulation or, you know, uh, weatherizing, which they can't. And um, it, it seems to come down with how do we reach people, educate people about what opportunities there are. But at this point, it seems like a lot of the low-hanging fruit has already been plucked. And the focus we want it, we agree, needs to be on residents. What can residents do? Um, one thing that came out of that meeting, though, was a request to have the Energy Board look at the rate structure for how we pay for electricity. There are those four um, divisions, uh, residents, commercial, large, small commercial, large commercial, and industrial, and each pays a different amount per unit. And so there was a request that the Energy Board review those rates and make a, some kind of recommendation back to Council. That, that request actually came from a citizen who was at that meeting. So I'm, I guess I'm asking Council to affirm that the Energy Board look at that. For what? Uh, when we the, get, um, so when we get uh, Courtney's kind of next step of the report that before we make any final decision about what we're going to do with rates that energy board get a chance to look at it and weigh in before yeah we make our i'm final not work. talking about 
this is the base rate. Yeah. 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 Yes. I, I think actually John is looking for some direction from council as to how you want him to do the analysis on the rates. And I think that's maybe where Energy Board comes oh. in is to kind of look at the different options and say to council, here's what we've found. And then council can say to John, okay, we want to look at what kind of impact this would have on these groups of users and make it, you know, more equitable, I think. Okay. Well, I don't um, that was that was my. Impression. I would love to hear from Energy Board on, okay. on that. Yep. Um, it, Sounds good. You know, especially if it can be done in a timely fashion. Um, we obviously do need to yeah. have that follow-up discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I haven't done anything with the school board. Uh, environmental commission. Um, the environmental commission talked about the um, the request that had come from council regarding proposal for a climate action plan recommendations and we actually meet tomorrow and uh, Deward Headley has been working on that so that will probably be one of our main topics of discussion tomorrow um, there was some discussion about the wellhead uh, Nadia Malarkey talked about the training that had happened I think it happened I don't remember April. if it had happened before that meeting or April. after, after that meeting, April. but there was an article that appeared in the paper about the training that she mm -hmm. did with staff, and she was very excited about that. It seemed like staff um, was appreciative of that. And HRC, HRC um, gave out three small grants. Um, there was a discussion about uh, the Yellow Springs Assistant Network that. Um, Chrissy Cruz is working on, which would not be a project of HRC, but could be something that could sort of spin off, just like uh, NAMI was worked on by uh, Catherine Hitchcock and I guess some other people in HRC, and then a spun off. And NAMI, by the way, did have a program last Thursday at the Little Art, it was a presentation by Squishy Man, who was someone with mental illness who is now traveling around the country uh, talking about mental illness. Um, and then there was a discussion about Mayor's Court, looking at the fees that have been coming in from Mayor's Court, um, which have been dropping over the years but as a result of less uh, going to Mayor's Court. So um, those were the main topics of discussion at HRC. Oh, and I will not be here for the next HRC meeting. Lori won't be here. I'll be out of so is there a council member that would be able to go to that meeting? It's on the June 3rd. June 3rd. It's 7 o'clock here. Um, it's, a um, it's a Thursday. It's, it's, it's always the first Thursday. Yeah, yeah, it's on the 4th, June 4th. Fourth. It must be June 4th then, yeah. yeah. I'm still out of town. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's on the 4th. I written it down. Okay. Yeah. So you're not here? Well, if you would I like am. me to attend, I would. I can do that. Okay. And that's it for me. I just, one quick thing on commissions. Um, CABA prepared uh, the roles and responsibilities for all the commissions, so uh, you should have gotten those for your meetings this month. Um, uh, and I don't know if, if you didn't, Judy would have any that weren't. Yeah, I had a suggestion on that that all of you folks got multiple copies of your for your various boards and commissions, and it, it might just be an easier thing if you get one of those, list out your boards and commissions, sign one, turn it in, instead of doing Three. three of them or four of them or five of them. Or five of them. Oh, so you mean to have each person sign one copy? Right, it lists all of the. Uh, I got you. Yeah. Oh, Do you mean you. for council members? Don't yeah. you think? Correct. For you folks. Right. Maybe. Actually, that's, you know, I went through and, and changed those. Did so you? that is what happened. Okay. So each council member just got, got one with the list. Okay. okay. Um, okay. But yeah, but all the commission ones uh, yeah. should have been disseminated. So. I don't think I got a park copy, but I, I mean, because I, I have that much. Oh, it was in your, probably planning Jerry commission. had it from yeah, the from planning the commission. Park. Yeah, I, I have it. No? Oh, you know what? I might, actually. I, I, I might, library. because I tend to look at, I, I don't know, I never understood I why. Really? Yeah. I do. Okay. I have it. You don't. I do. I'll give it to you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Awesome. All right. Um,
not much to report. Um, I did go to a DRG, Dayton Regional Green, um, mm -hmm. meeting last week, and the city manager from Oberlin was there talking about all of their energy efficiency programs. It was pretty fabulous um, to know what they're doing. Um, uh, and let's see, and he, they, they actually do support and do use um, Efficiency Smart, and he considers that kind of the cornerstone of their, of their energy efficiency program. Um, what they've done, though, is invest additionally into it. Um, so um, they consider it a value, a value to their community. Um, MVRPC it was a very short meeting, actually, but I did take um, Rati and, and Nadia and, in, and introduce them, so that was fun. And I think they enjoyed it. They liked the concise nature that we just <laughs> went in, everybody made decisions very quickly, and <laughs> they said, wow, how does this happen? <laughs> so they loved that. That was like, what, a couple of days after our last council right. meeting. Compared, <laughs> compared, 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 compared yes, to Yes, they were very <laughs> impressed. What the heck? Yeah. Okay, so next meeting. Um, so we're going to have the, sec the second reading of the supplemental. Any other legislation that we know of? The supplemental appropriations. Oh. Nope. Okay. May, there may be something. So the solid waste. Well, will there be? Will that have legislation? Be, it it will probably have a draft report for council, and then the um, just the um, approval to send it out at the at the meetings after that. Because okay. um, I'm meeting on the twentieth with um, the two Toms. Uh, Tom Clevenger and Tom Dietrich uh, to work on that. That was the first time we could all get together this Wednesday. So um, you'll have the rough draft of the RFP at the next meeting in your next packet, and then uh, we'll have to pass whatever legislation is necessary to get that out. So, um, okay, charter review report. That's how long will that take, Brian? Um. 15 minutes? Yeah, I would say we should give them 15 minutes, um, and then we may have some Q&A. Mm -hmm. yes. um, Chris, you think 15? I, I don't think, I think 15 minutes is plenty of time. Plenty. I think it has to be done by, <laughs> and I mean, it's, it's not complicated. I think the, the time's going to be with questions from council. And, and community. Yeah, there's some things we right. need to explain what the rationale was, but I think the initial presentation is five minutes yeah. of that. Okay. Yeah, it is okay. true the majority of changes are uh, not substantive, yeah. substantive, okay. so. So, Marianne is, so we've got the Environmental Commission on the climate, so that will be coming, we are going to have that at the next meeting mm -hmm. in 15 minutes, I mean 10 minutes maybe? Yeah. I think that's a fiber form report too. Um, so the village manager evaluation executive session, that's kind of out of that. So then the boards and commissions ordinance, is that just another discussion, Brian? Yeah, I think we're, the, we said the next step was we had a few changes from our last discussion, and then we were going to look at putting it into, like, pick one of the commissions and see what it looks like incorporated into their mission. So um, 10 minutes maybe for that? I think so. The way it's been going, we've... I think tweaked most of it. So okay. Then, if we want to add, I think I think it looks like we've got time to add the fiber forum report. Yeah, and I would say, short five minutes and questions. Um, uh, the group SpringsNet's going to put together a one pager. We've got the feedback that's all been summarized, uh, so that'll be in our packet, so we can ask any questions. So, council, do we want to do um, the executive session with Patty? I, first of all, let's decide if we're going to be ready. Do we have the evaluation document prepared? Um, I mean, you're, I, you're I going out of town. When are you? I'm, yeah, uh, June, is, June is just really bad for me, I, unfortunately, because um, I'm, I'm out of town that first week, and then I'm going to be out of commission for a couple right. week or two. Um, this, is even, this is for the first of June. This is even before June. Yeah, so I mean that we probably aren't going to be able to have that. It, 
you and yeah. I can maybe you and I can talk about the evaluation. We can probably at least get the process set up, but but we won't be doing her evaluation probably no, on the first. Thanks. Mm -hmm. so. Well, you have another month after that anyway, and and okay. not officially due for a raise for another six months after that. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. So maybe we'll just plan on having it mostly take place in July. Yeah. I mean, okay. Yeah. yeah, and then Lori will be back, yeah. so that would be good. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's, that sounds, and then I guess the next the next discussion is um, so we've got the ACE task force discussion on the fifteenth of June, work session on the another work session on the twentieth. Um, any you know, and, and then we're kind of in the middle of the sidewalk discussion. We clearly need to continue with that. Mm -hmm. um, any consideration to actually doing the sidewalk discussion? maybe switching those two doing the site continuing the sidewalk discussion at the next meeting can, can i make a suggestion sure um marianne and brian and chief and i are meeting to do some preliminary uh planning on the uh, task force or slash policing the police discussion policy. police yeah. policy discussion so um since john needs to gather some more information and i'm assuming once we do an initial talk on the police policy discussion we're going to want to go back and do some more why don't you kind of yeah flip-flop them why don't you go ahead and do the initial discussion on police policy on june 1st and then plan the sidewalks for the next work session and then you can move back to the task force because that gives john a month to gather information and it, then it gets the rest of us started on the task force or the policing discussion which needs to dovetail into the budget so yeah. so yeah, what like so then that. maybe that would be in in july so what you're saying though at the next at the june 1st meeting there will be some sort of a discussion or some sort of a report that, out that's what i'm recommending some, some type of a recommendation to council on how to proceed if, if right. marianne and oh, brian feel oh. like they might be okay prepared how, for how that. to proceed yes mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah and like what we're gonna how we're gonna move forward and yes, that way okay. then John can come back to the work session with the sidewalks again and then we can go on to the, ta the policing okay so let's let's keep ACE task force discussion process will be 6-1 mm -hmm. but it's not really the I mean it would be in the ACE task force it, yeah. would be included in there but what is it okay <laughs> so it's I'd say police, police policy. policy policing policy Mm -hmm. Policing policy, okay. Right on six one. And then, um, so then the work session will be um, sidewalks again. And then the work session tentatively will say that that will be the policing in July. Okay. What about the work session in June? Was what I meant to be. That's what I said with sidewalks. Yeah, okay. Aren't we saying that that's sidewalks? Um, yeah, yeah, I'm just missing it on here. I'm, I'm it's because it's not there. Because it's you just there. crossed it out. No. Well, yeah, it does. It said it said task force discussions. It just didn't say work session. Okay. Um, okay. Now, how, how many little mini discussions do we have now for June? You'll have two. You'll have policing policy, and then back to sidewalks. No, I'm talking about for the, our June 1st, our, oh, our first okay. meeting in June. One, two, three, four. Four, five is what I see. Okay. Nope, I'm sorry, six. Sorry, wait, six wait a minute. items? I'm of very policy, or you mean ordinances? Mini discussion. No, mini discussion items. You have the solid waste, the fiber forum, the charter review, the environmental commission, boarding commissions. That's what you're asking about. Yeah, right. right. I'm just trying to. And, but we're talking about ten minutes. Right. A lot of those. A lot of those are just reports out. Wait. I, I'm. I'm confused about something you just said. Did you say we're going to talk about policing at the work session too? No. no. Okay. That's okay. I could, only okay. one thing at the work session. Okay. So. That's just to be clear on that. Okay. Yeah. Some um, of those things. The charter. I don't think the discussion. The the presentation will take long. But depending on what's in that report there could be a few items that mm -hmm. make for some discussion that let's so let's let's Sorry. leave it out there when when we sit down to make to do to do agenda planning um we'll work on we'll aim to keep the meeting to two hours we'll start to flesh this out right, with these right. yeah, it'll be a little bit closer to see if we have more <coughs> um if we have more legislation and if it looks like we're doing we've got too much 
how about if we take, if we do put the policing process discussion, again, as a short discussion in the side, on, the, on June 15th. Mm -hmm. June work session. The June work session. Yep. So that will be the one that will, because. I'm, I'm, I missed you, as a short discussion? The planning the framework. Instead of oh. doing it on June oh, first, okay. do it on June That's 15th. if if okay. once okay. we flesh out the agenda, right. if it's yeah. looking too too busy. Yeah, because okay. I did, you know I, I don't know about the rest of it. Where I, it just, was. I just can't take three on the members. Right. Yeah, we're really trying to. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, and I apologize for tonight for whatever reason. This I'm I'm not I'm not acclimated to the work session <laughs> agenda yet. So. Um, I think that that's probably good. We won't know. It sounds like we don't know about the um, some of the legislation with, that are, that's going to go to planning commission. So, okay. So we've got the next two meetings planned. And what about the Courtney? I just don't want it to fall off. But we are apparently he's kind of waiting for us to he, give him some. He yeah, give him a little bit of direction on yeah. what kind of analysis or what kind of rate structure we want him to propose back, which is what. But um, I thought we wanted, we were having energy, energy board, board at, yeah. right. make So up. we just probably need energy board to take that up as soon as possible so that we can get back to John Courtney as soon as possible. Okay. Do you think you have the information you need to do that? Yeah, I still think we may have been talking about two different things, to right. be quite honest. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Because the energy board wants to, basically wants to look at how we're charging the four rate categories. I think yes. John is actually looking, talking about something different, right? I, I thought he was talking about how to structure the new rates to make them more yeah. equitable. Yeah. 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 So here's what I think the difference is. Right now, each um, oh, maybe had, each category has a base rate, and each base rate is different from the other category. Then John looked at those base rates, and he he used those rates to say, "Oh, is it?" Uh, commercial, big commercial is too high or something. Yeah. It, it were, it, but he, he 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 said that the there are certain categories that are subsidizing other categories, and that's not how it should be. And he's basically saying that the it, industrial and commercial is supplementing residential. And but those rates are actually lower than residential rates. Well, I think you guys need to look at it and make that. Yes. We can't have that discussion yeah, right, right now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But that's exactly what Energy Board can look at, and right. they can, they can uh, better understand John Courtney's recommendation, and then they Certainly can also say what, uh, what, they, uh, what they think. Can John attend the next Energy Board meeting? Um, I will have to ask him. Okay. Maybe he could be in... By phone, by phone, yeah. So we yeah. don't have to pay him travel time. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 aye.